There's a civil war brewing over at Marvel and Disney. Very interesting turn of events. We'll talk about that in a lot more with the one, the only, Cameron Pasha this morning. Good morning, campers. I hope you had a nice night of sleep because we've got a lot to talk about this morning, or at least one major thing anyway, and a few smaller things perhaps. Welcome, welcome to Midnight's Edge in the Morning. I'm Tom Connors. With me as always is the boss man, Andre. How you doing? Greetings, everyone. I am good. Thank you. Hope you're all having a wonderful day. I hope so as well. And joining us this morning, bright and bushy and early, is the one, the only Cameron Pasha. It's such a great honor as always to be on. This is, this is really my favorite channel on, on on YouTube. You guys do such an incredible job, and you break so much information. So I'm always glad to come on and and share my perspectives, and maybe give you guys a couple of uh, predictions today. Oh yeah, we are looking forward to it already, and it's always a pleasure to have you here. And right on cue, the wall says for five dollars. Kamran Pasha, I think he's being shadow banned or something. It's hard to find his channel for some reason. Please provide link. Actually, we have provided links straight to his web page, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is the more relevant because there you are going to find Kamran's books, which are excellent books that we yeah. highly recommend you to check out. Uh, and um, and yeah, also and, on Twitter, yeah. you're not even shadow banned. You're like out, uh, outwardly banned yeah, because I'm, the yeah, free I'm thinkers and uh, free speakers, that's, uh, that's problematic, isn't it? It is, and you know, and it's not a sustainable model for them. That you know, the way the world is, you try to control. You know, it's like it's we're having a flood of information, and you're trying. They're trying to dam it up and try to hold it. Water just gets around and finds another way. Information can't be held back, and so it's just their loss. But yes, I'm off Twitter. Uh, I am on Instagram, which is my name, Cameron Pasha seventy two. Uh, and so that those are the really best places to to reach out to me at this time, um, and then and here in the comments here in Midnight's Edge, you know, I, I actually do read the comments and 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 hopefully we'll be able to engage you all today. Yes, exactly. And speaking of engaging uh, you all, we have more than four hundred watching, which is uh, which is awesome. Everyone, if you can do us a huge favor, hit that like. Hit that like and help share the stream because uh, because this platform doesn't always do a great job in doing that. And today we have a very exciting topic, something that uh, coming on the sea year kind of has been like foreseen might be forecoming. So we've been speaking about this and now it's here. But yeah, we have a great audience here today. We have six joining us. We have Willie Woodward joining us. We have Gran Wasu42 joining us. We have Spider Unlimited who sent us a super sticker. And we also have Lady Ruskoline who sent us a hundred pounds to oh, start wow. us with. Wow, that's amazing. And she says, Hail Midnight's Edge. I believe I promised Midnight's Edge a hundred pounds if Dune moved its release date. Oh, wow. Very sorry I'm late paying, but at least, unlike Disney, I pay what is owed. <laughs> well, you've got great honor and generosity, Lady Ruskali. Where, where honor and generosity is, uh, is concerned, Lady Ruskalin is unparalleled. So I yes, thank you so much motion. for that. We we wouldn't have held you to it, but we really really appreciate it. It absolutely helps uh, helps us with the electricity bills and everything else that uh, that goes with it. Yeah, something so, yes. else that we predicted would be kind of uh, a problem is a problem today, and we're going to get into that here in just a little bit. Yes, indeed. Uh, the, we also the, got a super sticker from Spider Unlimited. I don't know if you grabbed that yet, but uh, yeah, we yeah we, we uh, did grab that. We, we have did. a couple okay. of others as well. Yes, we yeah, that I can't bring up. So yeah, yeah. and uh, then we also have the Invisible Man who says, "Love ya, Kamran. Disagree with your take on Black Woman, Black Widow, but love you anyway." So uh, yeah, and Black it's Widow awesome. is something we are going to. Uh, to get uh, get back to. And then Blind Fury doesn't send a super chat, but he still wonders. I think it's a good question. Do Netflix own the rights to He-Man movies? No, they do not own the rights to He-Man movies. Sony are the ones that currently hold the movie license. They don't own 
the He-Man movie rights altogether, but they are licensing them. And what may have happened, this hasn't been announced, but what likely has happened is that Sony has further sublet that movie license to Netflix. We don't know for a certainty that that is what has happened. We just know but, the movie is over there, yeah. Well, but we know that it's over there now. So it looks like Tom Rothman struck some kind of a deal with Netflix, meaning that Netflix right now, for all intents and purpose, purposes, temporarily sits on the movie rights to He-Man, yes. And, and if you mean uh, the 87 film? No, Warner actually retains the rights to that. Yeah, yeah, that's Warner. Uh, that's uh, all them. Uh, and then we have Stephen Otten here saying, Hail Andre, Tom, Commandant, Wrenches, and hey, Midnighters. Thanks for keeping the faith. Yes, indeed. Hail everyone. Uh, it's so nice of all of you to join us. Uh, David Amaro wonders, does uh, Cameron have his own channel? And as we just said, he has his own web page, plus, uh, plus uh, you have your own uh, Instagram. And, so and I do have a YouTube about? channel, uh, which is uh, the same as my Instagram, Cameron Pasha 72. Uh, and there's, uh, it, I'm just using that for my uh, creative works. There's a couple of short films on there if you want to see some things I've directed. Uh, and so that's what's, uh, what's, what it's there for right now. I'm not using it. Uh, I enjoy coming on channels like Midnight's Edge, uh, but I don't have my own channel that's, that's serving as sort of an interactional channel right now. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, you are for interaction and Cameron's predictions and interpretations of what's going on. You are in the right place already. Uh, and Golgo13 says, Gentlemen, it is popcorn time. Doubt the suit goes far. Odds of settlement and silence high. But who does not like a good clown show? Yes, hold that thought, because we are about to get into not one, but two pieces of Marvel and Disney news, and they are probably quite related. Uh, then we also have, yeah, SDR Red Wolf, he has some words of wisdom here. Hulk smash like button. Hulk yeah. not smash it too hard. Kill stream like last time. Hulk, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, Hulk smashed that like. That's a word to Don't live kick by. stuff. Uh, and uh, then uh, we have a couple of more super chats here. One that we can get up on, on screen is Hyperdiver2, who says, After the defeat of the Vokos, they have proved the justice of our culture. Now go and rest our heroes. Well, they might not want to rest just yet. I, there's still a couple of more, uh, more battles to be fought. Uh, and then Jewel Rice says for five euros, Andre loved your stream yesterday. Can't wait to hear Mr. Pasha's input on this. Oh, hi, Tom. And hail to the chat uh, and mods, of course. And yeah, the stream that Joel Rice is referring to was yesterday. I was uh, over at the Critical Drinkers, and we spoke uh, Conan the Barbarian for a few hours. So, what, when? Well, yesterday. No one told me. Well, sorry. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but yeah. Well, you were you were busy with uh, with with Midnight Edge after dark, so yeah. <laughs> no wonder. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, this is from before uh, before uh, before this super chat, uh, so, but we'll we'll do one now. Uh, Rob Adamson one says for five dollars. What is your guys' take on the argument that Netflix benefited by and planned over the backlash over Kevin Smith's execrable Masters of the Universe? To uh, me, that sounds like a very convenient excuse. Yeah, Tom, I, I, what does it sound like to you? Well, before we have Tom, 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 uh, uh, thoughts on this. I mean, if you look at it in the perspective of it, did Netflix probably get a hell of a lot more eyes on Masters of the Universe than they probably would have otherwise? Had Smith not made himself look like a complete boob, oh yeah, they they got a lot more uh, interest on this than than they had a, would have before probably. I now, I don't know. I purpose? think we I think we got more interest. Well, no, no, no. Uh, I don't know that Netflix like, got it. No, I think that there was people that probably didn't even know that they were aware of this thing until some of this controversy kicked off. And I'm sure a lot of people tuned in just for the specific reason to see. And this is why I think that. We're going to see a fifty percent or better fall off for the second half. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people just tuned in for the interest to see what the hell it was all about. 
because yeah, I know Masters is a huge franchise, as we said, but it, this took us all by surprise, and I'm sure it took Netflix by surprise too a little bit. But I think that's where Kevin was coming from. There's probably a kernel of truth in that bit where he's like, "Yeah, a few five, five, ten thousand people are pissed off, but you know, hundreds of thousands of people are watching it, so Netflix don't give a shit." When he says that, he's probably being sincere. Like they probably told him, like, because he probably called him in a panic. And he's like, what do I do? What do I do? They're all hating me. They're freaking out on me online. And he's like, Ke they're probably all like, Kevin, don't panic. That's 200 million people on fucking Twitter as opposed to all the other people who aren't even on Twitter. And you're freaking out over whatever. And we're doing just fine. Because from their angle, they don't see that side of things. They just see people clicking on it. That's my take on it anyway. Is I, I think if there's any truth to it, otherwise I just find it completely idiotic i mean that would make no sense whatsoever yeah but i mean I, 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 what's your thoughts on this i'm much more interested in that <laughs> well i'm interested in that or, or, or either mine or tom's guesses really but what do you think are well, I, 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 happy I, I, about the backlash you know i i well let me answer first i don't think it was planned i don't think that that's strategic right uh you know i i think you know the problem we're facing right now in hollywood is a bigger problem which is i think marketing departments are often disconnected from the the uh, the creative departments that's what that's the broader thing that we're seeing is the marketing departments and the marketing departments seem to have the uh, have the belief that you know, any controversy is gone good controversy and that you know any attention is good attention uh, i'm not so sure that that is actually true I'm not so sure having more people on social media being angry about your product is, is ultimately a good thing. But that seems to be where marketing departments are right now because uh, they're not very forward looking, in my opinion. They're just looking at what they where they think the moment is. I don't think they understand the moment. Uh, I do think Tom has an accurate perception of the kind of thing that probably happened. It's I, I don't I don't you know what we're seeing in Hollywood is a broader issue of people just not, not having their fingers on the pulse of society and of the fandom. They just don't have it. And, they, you know, they they because they're so busy trying to impress each other and the and the fandom isn't part of that club and so they don't they don't even they don't know how to balance kissing each other's butts and making the fans happy they don't know how to do it so they 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 focus on where they think the bread is buttered which is kissing you know the club and so they're just trying to keep the club happy and so the, all those comments and stuff was meant to to uh to make this club of employers happy and uh creating an oppositional situation with the fans they can't see that coming they don't you know they're not their minds are focused that way so i don't think ultimately it's a good thing uh i think the marketing department will tell everyone this is a good thing uh but i don't think that's how it's going to play out and i definitely don't think it was is any kind of strategy that got them there it's literally just an echo chamber uh that that it seems to be getting worse regrettably uh and i you know we've talked about how it was beginning to pull back and Global events in the last year have really solidified this echo chamber, and I think we're just going to have to have more economic loss before people realize none of this works. So if anyone thinks there's a this is a strategy, it's a badly thought out strategy. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. How there, how there. It's okay if the hardcore fans are pissed off and rant about it. More attention. That's the kind of marketing that I have never believed in myself. I have never subscribed to the notion that there's no such thing as negative press because there's just way too many examples of negative yep. press and how devastating that can be. I mean, just like every, at every single time you have like a movie coming out and then the reviews say, this movie sucks, and then it tanks instantly afterwards. Uh, or... Um, or the production problems, so everyone is a fully or, braced. Or, 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 or disconnect between sort of official reviewers and audience reaction, which we're seeing more and more of on Rotten Tomatoes, where we're seeing the official review of a movie as 42% from the official reviewers, and it's a 97% positive from, from the audience, right? Or, and vice versa. And when it's vice versa, you know, when the, when the official reviewers, it's 97% positive and 47% and positive from fans, Netflix, I'm sorry, uh, Rotten Tomatoes has been playing all kinds of games to try to invalidate those fan opinions, right? Which only creates more resentment and anger. Uh, and so this is this is it's a snowballing effect, and it's and it's not the effect that anyone who thinks this is a good thing is going to to be satisfied with in the in the in the medium term. Forget no one's thinking long term in this town, but just in the medium term, they're not going to be satisfied with 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 the outcome. Yeah, no, it'll be interesting. 
That's when they drop the next one. And Willie Woodward send, uh, says, uh, love the panel, love the wrenches, and love the chat. Yes, indeed. Well, thank Agreed you. We love you, Willie. Accounts. And, uh, and uh, Michael, Michael Miller. Miller wonders, uh, yeah, he wonders if uh, if T. Shen has an English dub. Is this, is this something you're familiar with coming on? I, regrettably, I'm not familiar with, with T. Shen, and I, I'm thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, I regret I don't want to make up an answer, so I, I don't have the answer to that. So uh, I'm sure that information may be available on the internet, but I, I'm I, I won't be able to answer that. Yeah. All right, and uh, then we have uh, our good friend Mike, the Mexican Iron Man, who says, and I think he sent this one uh, once already, but uh, but uh, can never have too much. Send it again. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, but thanks for the donation. Are you? Um, you pronounce it. Uh, uh, you friend. You pronounce it. And he says, "Hail my brothers and assalamu alaikum. Good yes. morning." <laughs> Question and answer. What's the difference between producer, executive producer, and directors versus showrunner? And when and how do these roles overlap for better or worse? And hail the great wrenches and chat peeps. Okay. So in, 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 a, in a nutshell, uh, those titles have different meanings in movies and television shows. In movies, the executive producer is often the person that helped finance the movie or helped put it together in some fashion or brought an actor on board or whatever, uh, but wasn't day-to-day -day involved in the actual making of the movie, but they have to legally get a credit. So that's often the case. Uh, and the producers in movies tend to be the, the, the hands-on leaders. They're the ones that will get the Oscars, right? Uh, whereas the executive producer won't actually walk away with the, uh, the statue. Flip it in television. In television, the executive producer is the top of the pyramid, right? A producer title is mid-level title, right? Uh, and it, in television, historically, directors worked for writers. And so, you know, in movies, it's the other way around. You ask about directors. In movies, and I have experienced this, the director is in charge. They often and very commonly will not even allow the writer to be on set. Right. Even though that might be helpful to the process when something's going wrong with the script to have the writer there just purely to remind everybody I'm in charge. Right. The directors won't even let writers be on set in movies uh, often. I've been in that experience situation. Flipped in television where directors historically have worked for writers. The writers are run the show. Uh, they are the people who are there week to week and the directors shuffle in and out. Uh, that has been changing in the last uh, two years, partly because of some choices that the members of the uh, Writers Guild did. They, we went on to a complicated war with our own agents, and the, uh, the Writers Guild leadership forced all of us to fire our agents as leverage, which I had to do. I have wonderful agents. I had to fire them. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to be a member of the Guild and work in Hollywood. And so in the, in the interim of that conflict with, with our own agents, uh, directors, the agents said, okay, fine, you you know, you don't want uh, writers to be represented by agents. We're going to put our focus on promoting our director clients. So in that time frame, uh, directors started getting a lot of power in television so that you'll see, uh, you know, I actually, actually, my understanding is that uh, there are Disney shows right now where directors really run everything, right? Uh, and the writers are there essentially as works for hire. So we're seeing the movie situation flipping. And so that's a horrible situation for writers because our once our leverage is, is, is disappearing and our power. The showrunner historically in television has been the writer, the creator of the show. Uh, you know, sometimes if it's a young writer with a lot of experience who wrote the pilot, they will bring a more experienced television producer on top of that person, even though they didn't create the show, they will be the showrunner executing the vision of, of the less experienced writer, the less powerful writer. Now, because the politics, what I've described, directors are beginning to assert themselves as the showrunners, which is causing a great deal of resentment and conflict uh, in, you know, in writers' rooms where writers are like, wait a minute, I thought I was the boss, right? And historically, I would have been the boss of the show, but I'm answering the director now. And even more so, we're beginning to see uh, producers who are non-writing producers. They're not directors. They're not directing the episode. They're not writing the episode. They're the person who got the rights to the book or whatever that the series series is based on. Those people are now beginning to assert themselves and say, I'm the showrunner. So this is going to be the major next conflict point in Hollywood where television, the power structure is now dissolving and we're not exactly sure who's in charge, uh, which isn't great for me as a television writer, right? And that's uh, This is the one arena that I thought was my arena. And now due to the Writers Guild's choices, we're in a place where we've lost a lot of our own leverage. That's a big answer, but it's a bigger quest answer than that. And that's how I can get it in a nutshell. 
Yes, indeed. And with that, we have a couple of more Super Chats, <laughs> and we're going to get through them all in the end. But for right now, in this moment, uh, I think we're going to start getting into the main story of today. And it's a real doozy, because for some time now, Kamran, you have, um, you have predicted that mm -hmm. Star Wars is going to be uh, is going to be um be fine now because the war over star wars have has kind of been fought and kathleen kennedy's side it looks like we're the ones that lost mm -hmm. now things are going to be much much better in star wars going forward by absolutely all outwardly accounts mm -hmm. which is something that we have documented with you extensively over the past six months while that battle has been fought and we've seen the battle reports from the front lines disguised in the trades and in the financial uh, papers and everything like that mm -hmm. what you also predicted was that the next battle might be over Marvel that is now increasingly steering the steering in the wrong direction. And one of the things that you said was the reason for that is that Kevin Feige, the head honcho of Marvel, who has steered it to all of its success, now has been elevated to a higher circle of cocktail parties. Mm -hmm. But the people there, they don't like this newcomer because he doesn't come from Hollywood royalty like mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. So they're starting to feed him bad advice, which is kind of like what we're seeing in the movies. But then something else appears to be happening as well. Because, um, Tom, uh, you can if you can bring this up on screen, the article I put in the private chat. We have um, we have uh, an article that came uh, yesterday. Actually, it does not yesterday. What happened was that uh, Black Widow, the star of Black Widow, Scarlett Johansson, is suing mm -hmm. Disney over the release of Black Widow. Mm -hmm. Can you take us through exactly what's the story here, Kamran? Uh, we here we also see that Disney responded to it, but let's uh, let's do it one thing at a time. Why is she suing Disney? So what I'll do is I'll give a, a surface explanation, and then we can go into yes. what I think is the deeper issue of, of what's happening here, right? Exactly, uh, and, and that will link to I think uh, you may have on record the Business Insider article. Yes, because, that's yeah. the next thing we're going we're to get into that two. because that that's is that, again, this is the surface. And then the Business Insider, that's I think is the real story. Yeah, and then and it's and there's a reason they came out the way they did one before the other so in my opinion uh and so the surface level of understanding is that scarlett johansson yesterday filed a lawsuit against disney uh you know specifically because she feels that the way that black widow was released which was simultaneously in theaters and simultaneously on disney plus uh, that that undercut the ability for the movie to make a lot of money in the theaters. Uh, you know, it, it made about eighty million or so first weekend, and then it just plummeted much more than any other Marvel movie. And I may yes, I remain of the controversial opinion that I liked the movie and I enjoyed it. I went and saw a couple of times in a theater. That may not be the majority opinion in the chat, but that's my opinion. And but so I was you know, a surprise because I don't think the quality of the movie deserves that kind of drop. So it makes sense that the reason for the drop is that uh, is because of what she's claiming, which is that people were, you know, they were they saw it. Even if they liked it in the theater, they went, well, I'll just watch it on Disney Plus now if I want to watch it again. Right. Uh, and uh, and others never went to the theater because of Disney Plus. I'll just watch it like my, my sister has, you know, several kids. God bless her. And, you know, she you know, she doesn't really be able to gather them all together. So she'll watch it on Disney Plus. I got to imagine piracy also played into this as well. Piracy is a major issue as well, because, as you know, there are entire hackers and copies out there. Yeah. Yeah, they're just dedicated to hacking the the code for Disney Plus, and they'll recreate pristine copies. This isn't this isn't somebody with a steady cam inside of a theater selling it on China in Chinatown, right? This is stuff like you're watching on it, and and that is created because it's digitally available. Uh, and so that her lawsuit is based on she had been promised, or she claims she has been promised a very large uh, sum of the theatrical grosses you know top actors and she's a top actor she's probably i think she's the highest paid actress in hollywood right now uh are able to ask for 
you know, the way that the theater economics works is that that the theaters keep at the end of the day about 50% of the actual thing. So if you if a movie makes $200 million in its theatrical run, the theaters average out to keeping about 100 million of that and 100 million goes back to the studio, right? Disney is often in a place to aggressively change that formula, which they did on Star Wars, uh, where I think theaters ended up keeping something closer to 40%, Disney kept 60%. Uh, and so the a powerful actor can keep, can actually say, because you know most people get what is called net points, which are meaningless, right? They get, you know, everyone gets a fake profit sharing thing in Hollywood, where if the movie, you know, if the movie is profitable, you'll get, you know, two percent of the net profits. But the Hollywood accounting structure, so there's never any net profits, right? Everything is always a loss. You know, Lord of the Rings, uh, you know, New Line claimed Lord of the Rings, which made multiple billions of dollars, was in the loss, right? And until uh, un until the director, you know, uh, Peter Jackson sued them, saying you owe me money, right? <laughs> this movie isn't not profitable, but the, every Hollywood movie is not profitable net officially. So smart people and powerful people like Ms. Johansson can negotiate up front and said, I don't want no net profits. That, that means zero. That means nothing. I want a shake. I want a stake in the actual upfront ticket sales before you even go through your accounting system. So I every ticket that's sold, I get a piece of that upfront. It's called gross, right? And so she gets a piece of the gross. And so she feels that had they not done this strategy of simultaneous streaming, that the gross ticket sales would have been multiples of what they are, right? They she thinks they might have been three, four, five hundred million dollars, uh, you know, even with the current events and health restrictions and all those stuff that's happening. And that her stake in that would have given her $50 million out of that ticket pool, right? That's what she's claiming. And because they did it this way, she lost $50 million because, you know, the movie didn't make a lot in the theaters. Uh, and so her claim in the, is that she actually, once, once we started seeing in the last year, more and more HBO Max, Disney started doing this kind of simultaneous streaming thing. She claims her lawsuit that she, or, or perhaps, I mean, who knows how much she understands the economics of it, but the but the, her representatives who are very powerful agents saw, okay, if they do this with Black Widow, she's going to not make money, right? It's potentially not make money. And that they attempted to renegotiate with Disney to give them some kind of payout. And, you know, there's, uh, my understanding is that on Wonder Woman 2, which is a bad movie, uh, HBO Max, which I think knew it was going to be a bad movie and put it out simultaneously on streaming, ha in order to satisfy Gal G Gadot and Patty Jenkins gave them a payout saying, okay, look, we're not going to do the tr traditional single theatrical release, right? But here's like, you know, 20 million bucks and be happy and go away. And I think they were quite happy because I, I don't think that movie would have succeeded if it had been single theatrical anyway. It's not a good movie. Uh, so apparently... The agents, the lawyers for Ms. Johansson claimed that the agents attempted to renegotiate. Disney said, oh, sure, we'll renegotiate. We'll give you like HBO Max, Warner's did with, uh, with, with Gal Gadot. We'll give you some money to make up for what might be a loss from this original contract. And she claims they never actually did it. And then, voila, she gets news. Oh, they're putting it out. They didn't even talk to us about it. They put it out, and, they didn't, and here's my loss. Yeah, because need I remind everybody, for the longest time, they kept beating that drum. No, 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 no. Black Widow is coming in theaters only. And Andre and I kept saying, don't count on that. Did we not, Andre? We predicted that. We did. We saw every single time when they said, no, no, it's coming to uh, going to theaters. We said, well, it's still six months. It's still three months. It's still two months. It's going to go straight to Disney Plus. You wait and see. Well, that's exactly what happened. So it's a Disney Plus release with some theaters on the side. So and, and she claims in her lawsuit that this was a strategic thing. I mean, she's it's a very aggressive lawsuit because she names names. She claims that the current leadership of Disney, and by naming them Bob Chapek and Bob Iger, right, the sort of the shadow. Well, there was CEO. even an email from March, mm -hmm. wasn't there? Mm -hmm. So what was the email? There was like an email from March where they're actually where her legal team is actually talking to Disney, where they're talking yeah. about renegotiating. Mm -hmm. But that was where her claim is the last time they had spoken about it. Yeah, and that we'll discover if that's actually true or if there was any further conversations or handshake deals. We don't know yet. We'll find out. My instinct is this will get settled. It will never go to court. They'll pay her out oh, to yeah. get this go away. But yeah, but but I want to go back to what I was saying about in the lawsuit names Bob Chapek and Bob Iger and says that their compensation is based on you know Disney shares, 
which are linked to the success of Disney Plus, right? And so she's saying they're incentivized personally to d increase their own personal wealth to put this on Disney Plus. And that's something we've all sort of known. For her to come out right and say that, it's it's considered taking off one of the curtains of of the Wizard of Oz, right? Uh, and uh, and so you don't you don't do that publicly. So this 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 whole lawsuit is quite shocking to Hollywood because number one, she's the most powerful uh, actress in Hollywood right now, and for her to go against this dangerously aggressive studio, and I've worked for them, right? The very first time when I was hired at Disney, my lawyer called me and said, I was so excited I got my thing to work on the Tron animated series. He said, just be careful over there. These aren't good guys. He said, <laughs> That's the first thing my lawyer called me and said, this is the least uh, honorable place in the industry, right? That's what he called as a lawyer to tell me that, uh, that, you know, th these are these are people that pride themselves on being the bad guys. That's Disney. That's what my lawyer called me to say. That was 10 years ago, and I'm sure it's not any better yet now. So, this is quite shocking to Hollywood. So we're still talking surface level. That's the official narrative. And everyone is shocked that she's doing this, that this wasn't, they're shocked that this wasn't pre-settled in advance like uh, Warner's did with Gal Gadot. They're shocked by that and they should be shocked. If that is indeed the case, it is quite shocking. But we're going to go beneath that and wonder if any of this is shocking, whether everything yeah. that's happened with Black Widow is part of a deeper thing that's been brewing between Disney and Marvel for a long time and between personalities, between Kevin Feige and, and Chapek and others. And we're going to look into that. So that's the official level of shock when you're just looking at the surface level things of what's happening here. Uh, and so maybe we can explore what really is happening here because I, right. you know, it doesn't make sense on the surface level. So well, because something else is going on. I think my biggest point of shock here is that it got to this point. I can't mm -hmm. believe Disney didn't settle it ahead of time. So to me, that signifies there's an, a bigger underlying problem. Correct. Here. Correct. Yeah. And, and I think we'll, really and we'll, that, and we'll yeah. get into that. But first, let's have a look at Disney's official response. Yeah. Because a Disney spokesperson. Which was basically, responded, you're a selfish bitch. Fuck off. <laughs> that's what it was. Let's that's what it was. But let's read, uh, read, read it in business speak. What yeah. it said <laughs> There is no merit whatsoever to this filing. The lawsuit is especially sad and distressing in its callous disregard for the horrific and prolonged global effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Disney has fully complied with Miss Johansson's contract, and furthermore, the release of Black Widow on Disney Plus with Premier Access has significantly enhanced her ability to earn additional compensation on top of the 20 million she has received to date. So that was the official. Well, response. so let's look at the back because on that there's two things there. One, that's you know there uh, the claim that they fulfilled a contract. Well, I'm sure that's absolutely right. But the point is that uh, the contract needed to be readjusted based on the choices they were making, and they chose not to engage that conversation. So that's legalese. There, they said it very carefully. Yes, they they fulfilled the contract, but then the contract. Remember, this is this is a movie that that should have been made five years ago and has been in the can for a while, right? And so this contract came from an a pre an earlier time before the dynamics of streaming and the dynamics of, of the world situation had manifested, right. right? So they're very aware of that. They're using that phrase on purpose, right? It's an old, it's, yeah, former lawyer here, old legalese. We fulfilled the contract, right? Uh, and okay, get it. But you know, other circumstances have happened that maybe have made that contract, what we would call it in, in law school, unconscionable. And we can debate that. So that's one thing. The second thing is something that I think is, is just not true, which is that the success of this movie is going to give her more leverage. The movie didn't succeed, in my opinion, unfairly, right? It should have succeeded, in my opinion. Uh, and I hope others will still watch it. Uh, but it's, so the, that doesn't help anybody. The, one of the first rules of Hollywood is you're only good as your last picture. It doesn't matter if you have five Oscars. It doesn't matter if you if you grossed, you know, billions of dollars in <laughs> ticket sales over the course of your career. Your last movie bombs, you've taken a hit. This industry only cares about what you've just done, right? Ang Lee, had two Oscars in a row, and then he made a series of not so great choices creatively. And you know, ten years later, you don't hear about him anymore. One of the greatest filmmakers of our time, uh, because you know, the moment right after Life of Pi, his next thing didn't work. Boom, he's done. So that's not true. But you know, so that it's it's interesting the kind of uh, it, it feels in some ways that this it's almost emotional that press release, which is you know they this will go into the layers of what is going on here it feels like this is coming from a place of anger from disney executives that and that's because there's something deeper happening here yeah it kind of feels strange that 
Because, like I said, it's funny that we've gotten to this point. Normally, Disney would just pay somebody off to shut them up, especially in yeah. a situation like this that would make them look really bad. You Which would that, think that yeah. they, that once it got released or once the word got out, I mean, her, her I don't agent think it would have got to that point. Normally, was what yeah, I'm I mean. Somebody would yeah. have made a call. Her agents. Her, I, I mean, her agent is Brian Lord, who's the head of CAA, which is the most powerful agency, right? And he's the most powerful agent. So do you think Bob Chapek ain't going to take a call from Brian Lord saying, hey, what's going on with my client? Right. I heard you doing this. Of course you took that call. Right. So this is either or that call didn't go the, the way they think or they, this is part of a thing where they held back that call and dumped this lawsuit as part of a plan. Well, and that's what yes, I'm saying. And, like, um, oh, go ahead, Andre. Uh, yeah, and we'll get into that plan because, as we said, there was another article also coming out uh, at, in much the same spy, same time space. Uh, we're putting that on screen right now. Yeah, and this is from yeah. Insider, no, this which is, is then. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, that is, yeah, this came last week. So, but still, they might be connected because they this story then from back. last week. It is last week really important because the, the reason it came out last week, we're going to talk about that. This is in part of my view, this is something part of a strategy. So let's get into it. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, this article it's hidden by behind a paywall. But what it describes is that Hollywood Insider says there's growing tension at Disney as CEO Bob Chapek shaves at Bob Iger's long goodbye. And one of the things that it says inside of this article is that there's growing tensions in Disney. We've heard this before, but there's tensions between Iger and Chapek in particular. Uh, Chapek is frustrated with Iger because the guy won't leave. He was supposed to be gone uh gone a long Last time year, ago but yeah. he's still there and he's doing his long goodbye meanwhile chape uh, is a source of frustration for Iger as well because Iger isn't convinced that chape is doing things the right way now what other things in this article do you find interesting what stands out to you in conjunction with this piece from uh, from Deadline Hollywood about the, the Scarlett Johansson Black Widow Disney lawsuit. I mean, there's so many things. This article, this article, we talked about articles this year a lot, Andre and Tom. We talked a lot about articles that they don't just pop up out of nowhere. This thing is a hit job, and it's a it's a fascinating hit job because it's multi layered, right? This thing didn't come out of nowhere. This thing has so many messages being sent. And we can analyze where the messages are coming from. First, just the revelation that Chapek and Iger are in conflict. You know, intuitively, I think I've always believed that the moment I heard Ch Iger was coming back, it, you know, once you give somebody a CEO role and you come back, it's insulting and, and creates resentment. That doesn't shock me, right? Uh, and so, but the, the public discussion shocked me because the first time anyone, to my knowledge, has acknowledged that there's tension between these two over this fact that this guy won't go away. You know, he's supposed to step down and he won't go away, right? And so, this is the first time Business Insider, again, look at where it's coming from. This is this is targeted towards the shareholders. This is something that people, you know, the, the hedge funds are reading. And so in, in the same way that, you know, when we went to Forbes, this is another Forbes kind of attack, which is, you know, letting the shareholders know there is a problem inside management, right? And the way this article is structured, I could be completely wrong, but I'm going to give my opinion. My opinion is this is coming out of Bob Chapek's office or out of his allies, because to reveal conflict between these two men, the only person that could benefit from that is the current CEO, because the whole point of this article is this guy should not be there anymore. He stepped down. So why is he still here and not letting the CEO do the job? Hey, shareholders, your CEO is being interfered with by, by this, this Emiratus guy that won't leave. That's going to affect your share price, right? That's conflict like this is really bad for shareholders. They need to know who's in charge. And if it, if Chapek is the one that's officially in charge, it's time for Mr. Iger to leave, right? This feels like Mr. Chapek, in the same way that I think his team engineered the Forbes article to oust Ms. Kennedy shortly after the Gino Carano nonsense, right? I think this is a moment where Ms. Chapek is like, okay, you know, I took I took out 
uh, one adversary. Now I've got to get this guy out of my life, right? And and push him along into his grateful sunset. And that's that's the first level. But there's so many more layers to this, right? The other thing that this article, and maybe you can go into it where, where it talks about it, the article actually talks about tensions with Marvel and how Marvel has been, you know, Mar people at Marvel, Kevin Feige has not been happy with some of the choices. And anything like this that's naming people, that's all intentional. That's naming all the players on the board for whoever is behind this, right? And so that's the bigger issue here is that this article talks about there being tension between Marvel and Kevin Feige and the Disney executives. And the third thing this article says, it's a throwaway line, but it immediately it flashed at me, like flashing lines when I saw it, which is the article says that Mr. Chapek is going to be eliminating the 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 – the process that the Mr. Iger had where he would give executives in these subsidiary companies like Marvel, like Lucasfilm, he would give them multiple year long-term contracts. And this article says that Mr. Chapek is ending that so that he can get rid of people faster. Number one, that's a direct reference to Ms. Kennedy because she had this long-term contract that nobody could get her out of, right? Uh, and so that led to chaos for this company. And it also suggests who else has a long-term contract? It's Mr. Feige, right? And so the article suggests the creatives are resentful of that. Well, of course they're resentful of that because he's take, he, uh, JPEG is asserting, I'm the boss here, and if I don't like your performance, you're not going to be here for four years. I'm going to get rid of you. Those are our new contracts moving forward, right? All of this is being done because the industry, the shareholders, don't care about the Hollywood politics. They care about rational economics, which Hollywood doesn't necessarily follow. And so when you a shareholder reading this go, yeah, that's a good idea. Why should you have long term contracts for people that aren't performing in Hollywood? You do that because it's the privilege of the club. But shareholders aren't thinking that way. And this is an article aimed at them. This is, in my view, the beginning because this came out about a week ago and didn't cause a lot of buzz. It should have caused buzz. I honestly didn't see this until yesterday when our good friend Stephanie Janicek sent this to me. I was like, oh, why didn't I see this before? You know, and partly I'm not on Twitter anymore, so I'm not paying attention like that. But I was like, this really, be, this didn't cause the, the waves it should have. But then one week after this article comes out, we have this surprise lawsuit by, uh, by Scarlett Johansson on a Marvel project. And her attack is consistently, I don't, I, to my knowledge, she's not blaming Kevin Feige for the choices on Black Widow. And there have been a lot of bad choices on Black Widow by Mr. Feige, such as releasing it, you know, so late. This is a movie, and putting Captain America before this, right? It didn't make any sense. And there's there's lots of reasons as to why he may have chosen to work with Ms. Larson over uh, Johansson. That, those are, that's another conversation. But she's not blaming him, even though this whole thing has been mismanaged from the start. She's blaming by name, you know, Iger and Chapek. And, uh, and so... To me, seeing these two things happen and then the surprise in the industry and the surprise at Disney by the lawsuit suggests to me, I think, and I could be 100% wrong here, but my instincts are that Mr. Feige probably had a conversation with Ms. Johansson and said, uh, you know, you, you got really screwed here. I would have I would have given you this, right? I, uh, you know, I think I think the best thing for you to do is sue them. I mean, I feel like this is an instigation. It, it, this is a part of a war. The, you know, Chapek asserted himself in that article, and then the, the Marvel camp asserts itself with this move by one of its more powerful players. And so this is one of the this is a much bigger fight than what we saw with with Lucasfilm, which everything was kept beneath the surface. This is shockingly public. And it's because Mr. Feige, I think. You know, he sees himself as a member of the club. He has a strong sense of confidence of his creative abilities, which, you know, we'll, we'll see whether the new vision of Marvel continues to justify that confidence. But he certainly has that. And I don't think I do not think Scarlett Johansson could have done this if she felt that it would alienated, you know, all of her allies, including Feige. And I, I and it feels like this was instigated by that camp. Because it doesn't make rational sense that the most powerful agent in Hollywood did not resolve this before it was done. It, my instinct is Disney, the emotional reaction of that press release suggests they thought it was resolved. They thought they had had some conversations and there was a handshake understanding of how things would play out. And then this lawsuit law lands in their hat. And so it's part of a, it's, it's an attack that they didn't see coming because Mr. Chapek set this thing in business insider in motion against, against his adversaries. And now we're having a full scale war happening. That's a big answer, but I really think, this is these are not 
independent events. This is part of a strategy on both sides. Well, yeah, and uh, just going through, uh, Kamran, who do you think the sides are here? And what's each side's ultimate goal? Yeah, well, I'm I curious think, because yeah. uh, I may mm -hmm. have reason to believe that there is a bit of uh, mm -hmm. favoritism being played here, but we'll get into that after I hear your yeah, sure, sure. I mean, you know, like I said, there, there, there's certainly some kind of personal politics involved. But based on just the things that I'm seeing, and I'm not claiming I got this from my friends, you know, because you know, I was like, oh, you're unnamed sources. I'm just, this is, this is my uh, perception, right? This is just a... Uh, my perception as someone's done this for 20 years and and been the victim of these politics and seen how they work right so my perception is that the two sides are very specifically two people it is bob chapek versus kevin feige now that mr chapek has successfully in my view removed miss uh miss kennedy from the board uh he is now going for a full scale sweep he that was essentially i think the victory over kennedy which everyone thought was impossible including his predecessor Iger, thought i just can't take this check on man just let just write it out and, and take the losses it's and he and he i think created a, outmaneuvered her and did the stuff that mr Iger was afraid to do which is use the press against her which is her sword right now I think he's become extremely confident. This is my time to take control. I'm, I'm beginning to get really upset of Mr. Chapek as a very ruthless and Machiavellian guy. And I think he was underestimated by Bob Iger. He, Bob Iger probably thought he's putting his, uh, sort of like Putin put his buddy in charge for a little bit, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so so that he, he could have his puppet there. I think that's what they thought, the, Mr. Iger thought the relationship was. This article, Business Insider, s shows that Chapek, I think, is turning the sword against his own mentor. And then against the other threat, who's he, now with Kathleen Kennedy out of the picture, uh, for all intents and purposes, who's the other player that's a threat to J Bob Chapek's power and control and his job? It's Kevin Feige, who's the most powerful person inside that company now that Ms. L that Lucasfilm is essentially been you know neutered. And so this is this is a power play. The, what I said to uh, well, my, our friend Stephanie Janicek, I said to her, this reminds me of Stalin going after Trotsky. Right? That's what this is, right? You know, you got to get rid of you got to get rid of all your rivals. And I think this is Chapek versus Feige. I think Chapek put things in motion, uh, and there were things in motion behind the scenes. But this article was him saying, "I'm the boss. Iger's going to get out of my way, and all of you clowns are going to listen to me, right? And I'm telling the shareholders that's in their interest." And then, voila, Mr. Feige, who is who is. Uh, someone who is quite confident about his own power in the situation suddenly has a sword back at him where black widow you know which he'll say this wasn't my idea this is you know in fact that's even what's implied in business insider that they don't agree on strategy on how to get these things out and that mr that feige wasn't happy with the way that that black widow was released that's said in that business insider article and so we're now seeing one week later the counterattack. So yeah, so you think that is what the lawsuit is? That yes. this is uh, this is the Kevin Feige uh, faction's counterattack to uh, to Bob Chapek asserting himself and making changes in contracts so that he, in principle, if Kevin Feige at some point should displease him, he can just say, okay, now we have yearly contracts instead of like five-year contracts or whatever. Which is so the all norm. I have to do is not renew have you any longer. Executives in Hollywood, generally, it's musical chairs. You stick around. If you're lucky, you stick around 18 months, right? You know, and to have someone locked in for five or six years, that's multiple lifetimes in this industry. And that's not the norm, right? And so Chapek is trying to bring Disney into a, a more of a normative studio, which where Disney is the, is the you know, the, the center of the club. And it's it's done things its its own way, and prided itself on doing things its own way, and part of prided itself as being the profitable elite, which has been shaken in the last year. So yes, this is my view because it doesn't. This lawsuit doesn't make rational sense. There's no Brian Lord at CAA on Wednesday could have called Disney and said, "Look, Scarlett's really upset. She's thinking of doing a lawsuit," and they would have settled it. So this that's not what happened. This lawsuit is a shock, and it's a, and it's an attack, and the and the, the shock in the in Hollywood reveals that it's not something that's done normally. So this is not a normal thing. This is a part of a war. Well, the only thing that I see is kind of a a bit mm -hmm. of a I don't know what you would call this, 
but it's a strange wild card. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's not a connection here that Feige's not responsible for Chapek getting in where he is in the first place. Um, because a while back, Chapek's son started working for Marvel. And uh, that's interesting. Yeah. So that's that. So there's many layers to that. Uh, but from the layer that I'm suggesting is what's happening here is on one level, Mr. Feige would be like, sure, I'll bring your, you know, it's Hollywood's all nepotism, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'll, bring, yeah. I'll bring your kid in, right? Uh, and he's thinking, he's thinking from his services, okay, I'm going to have the little kids here. So the kid's going to talk to the dad and it's going to be the reference point, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, that that's and and from Mister Mister Chapek, so he's like, okay, I got my spy in. <laughs> so each side thinks it's got an angle on the other with that kind of situation. Yeah, because this is all going back, and like I'm starting to see a convoluted web here, because everybody was kind of surprised by Chapek being the pick in the first place. Remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that I'm came out of to, nowhere. Yeah, and 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 it sounds like uh, Chapek's son was working for Marvel, and he's got a pretty big role in Marvel. He is actually the uh, it would be Brian Chapek, and he is the director and of and in production development. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a pretty you know subsequent role in the company. Yeah. So I'm just curious if there isn't uh, like this isn't look. I'm gonna posit this out there, Cameron. Okay. Okay. Feige is obviously known to play some politics behind the scene. Look how he got uh, what's his face booted from Marvel. Uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, I, Perlmutter. Per, Perlmutter. I, Perlmutter. Yeah. yeah. Like how he basically used Bob uh, Iger mm -hmm. to get rid of Perlmutter. Mm -hmm. Now, who's to say he isn't using JPEG to get Iger out of his way, too? I mean, it, it certainly, it's certainly possible. That, that, I mean, that these the layers of politics here are very real. But I would think, I would, you know, I, I would think because the tone of this Business Insider article is that Chapek is ruffling feathers of the executives and that Mr. Feige is unhappy with the choices and Chapek is owning those choices. He's, you know, he's saying, this is what I want to do. Right. And as Carl Johansson's lawsuit claims, he's incentivized to push Disney plus forward as you know. And so my instinct is still that this is a war between those two men. And yeah. I, I just don't, I mean, Iger's such a huge figure to have him, you know, essentially thrown under the bus in biz by Business Insider. Only you know someone who you know Qui Bono who who benefits right? Who benefits is is, is Bob Chapek. And historically, Feige has prospered under Iger's rule. So yeah. it doesn't make sense for him to want this guy out because he has a long-standing understanding with this guy. This other guy is already saying, "I'm going to be in charge." Look what I just did to the untouchable Miss Kathleen Kennedy. You think you're untouchable? And now we're going to see how this is going to play out because Mr. Feige has a lot of public support. You know, maybe that's waned a bit in the last year with some of the choices that have been made, but he still has, he's still seen as the name uh, in a proud way. Like there was a lot of public resentment towards, you know, Kathleen Kennedy's Lucasfilm, but there's a lot of pr public investment in Feige as the vision of Marvel. And so he still has a lot of arrows in his quiver. So this, this is going to be, you know, we had fun talking about Bob Chapek and Kathleen Kennedy. I, 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 looking back, that was just like, you know, that was like a, you know, a, a donkey show in Mexico, man. It was, it, was, it, was, it was nothing compared to what we are about to see here because these are two powerful people that are willing to pull out the guns on each other, the, you know, at a very high level. This right. is going to be, I don't know who's going to survive this. My instinct is Bob Chapek will survive this because my I've been surprised, even a little delighted by how dangerously Machiavellian this man is. And he understands how to use uh, PR, right? Uh, which, it, and he's, and what the difference is Mr. Iger used PR as well, but it was all self -aggr aggrandizing. You know, you never saw any critical stuff of Iger in the press because he was just like the golden boy, right? This guy will let himself be criticized in the press. He will let himself be seen as a cuckold, essentially. I'm, you know, <laughs> this guy's banging my wife. Iger's still here banging my wife, right? <laughs> and I'm trying to break into the bedroom and take back my wife. That's, that's, that he's willing to let himself be portrayed that way in order to achieve his objectives. He, we, we talked about when the Kathleen Kennedy articles came out, uh, you know, that 
this guy's, you know, this is humiliating stuff for Chapek. Humiliating, but it achieved his objectives, and Kennedy's out, right? Well, and I just... Uh, I'm here. Sorry, go ahead and say the last yeah, part. Yeah. I guess yeah, please. No, you were just saying the last part. Say it again. Yeah, no, I'm saying, but, you know, he's... The most dangerous person is the person that will has no fear of hurting themselves to hurt you, right? right? That is the most dangerous person in the industry. And because of that, I think Mr. Chapek will win. He is not afraid of humiliating himself, of looking bad publicly in order to get what he wants, which is final victory. That's a guy that you can't defeat. Mr. Feige is loving the attention. Right, yeah. he loves the accolades of being this visionary of Marvel. That's a weakness. If I were some a Machiavellian guy like Mr. Chapek, and maybe I'm a little bit like that because I kind of understand him, right? <laughs> Is that the accolades are not what's important? You don't want the accolades. You want power. Accolades is a is an addiction. You know, Machiavelli says this. In the in the Prince, which is a wonderful book, if you understand Hollywood, read read the Prince. And Machiavelli says that it is nice to be loved as the Prince, as the King, right? It's nice to be loved, but it's not necessary. In fact, it can be a weakness, right? And because there will be times when you need to do things that the public, your subjects, won't like, but they need to be done. And so, if you are addicted to their adoration, you will not do it, and you will lose power, and then you will lose their love. And he, he said that 500 years ago. He's still right. So Mr. Feige wants to be loved. And look at this. He's like, but you're ruining my franchise. That's from someone who wants to be loved. Whereas Chapek is like, you, you guys are messing with my turf, and I'm going to take you all out. That's the more dangerous guy. Well, that's what I want to know is that's the bigger question to me because looking yes. at this whole thing is whoever the bad guy in this situation or at least the one who's who's causing the problem is whoever made the decision to put – black widow on disney plus and decided not to release it in china because to me those are the two things that are going to kill this case in the end and whoever made that decision between the two of them is the one at fault here right because that's what i'm seeing here but you know looking at this article from the insider here you know they're talking about how chapek ultimately is the one who who's being made to look bad here right like his, his stock is what's cooling off is what it sounds like to me because when when this goes to court mm -hmm. what is going to win if it even gets to court right cuz chances are we know it's it's going to probably get settled but what's going to win this case for miss uh mm -hmm. Johansson at least in my opinion is that a there was no reason to release it simultaneously and no matter what act of god excuse they use all, 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 all the def all, all, all Johansson's lawyers have to say is, "Were theaters open? Yes. So then, what was your excuse? Because you had three major movies just open up in the last few weeks, and you had plenty of time. You didn't announce until the last minute that you were doing this, right? So in the end, it's still Disney who's looking bad, and whatever excuse they use, it's never going to look good. Plus, they she could even pull out the well, you didn't release it in China card. So there's a whole nother bunch of money she was out." So that's the thing is no matter what excuse they use as far as an act of God or whatever that the current situation is, I don't think it's going to hold up in court. I think she's got a pretty solid case here. I don't know what you're thinking, but again, I think it's going to all boil down to who made the choice to put it on Disney plus at the last minute, because it sounds like that's what pissed Marvel off. Cause that's right. Yeah, And I think that was Mr. Chapek. I think that was Mr. Chapek. And I'm not so sure we can blame him for China because China does whatever it wants to, and it likes to use its leverage. So I don't know that Disney said, we're not going to run in China. Uh, I'm sure they well, wanted to it said to the article here. Somebody made the choice not to put it in China because it would have corresponded with their uh, celebration. Well, it, okay. Well, you know, well, who knows exactly the dynamics, whether the Chinese also told them we're not going to accept it, right? I mean, we don't know all the secret dynamics there because China really is the one calling the shots on these things. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I agree with, with that. Uh, yeah. I mean, Disney well, can't says, decide to put it out there or not. I mean, that's China's call. Well, no, yeah. but, but, but the bigger China's issue is the one you're saying. Yeah. Disney's choice of a July 9th release, the latest movie internationally, bumped into China's month long celebration of the Chinese party's 100 year anniversary. So it doesn't sound like China said no. Uh, Again, you don't know. I mean, because said that China has yet to give a release date. 
That's yeah. all it but, says here. But the bigger issue is not China for me. The bigger the bigger issue is the streaming. That's the bigger issue because everyone in Hollywood knows China. You never know exactly what's happening there. But you do have a choice about putting it on streaming at the same time. That's you're fully under your control, right? Uh, and so my instinct it is, and I think Business Insider suggested it is Chapek and his leadership that did that, right? Because the way they position it is that Iger is the one still controlling the creative reins, but the business reins are in Chapek's hands. Well, that's a business decision. That's not a script decision. That's not a director decision. That's a way, how do we put distribute this product, right? That's a business decision. I have no doubt that that came from uh, from Mr. Chapek to do that. And uh, and I do agree that, that the reason the industry is reacting with such shock is that it is such an aggressive attack. And at least the case as presented in Ms. Johansson's filings, which are one point of view, right? I'm sure disease lawyers have other claims in response to that. Uh, and personally, I think there probably was some kind of handshake understanding. How could it not there not have been? It shocks me. And so I do think this is Mr. Feige's clan coming at JPEG with a full sword. And the instinct is if he's a smart Machiavellian guy, he'll settle it, he'll settle it out. Um because ultimately, this isn't Feige himself. This is Ms. Johansson, right? So even if she's listening to him and and being influenced by him, saying, "I hate this guy. This guy screwed both of us," right? At the end of the day, she's going to walk out with her payout. If she if they give her a fifty million dollar check tomorrow, I think that thing goes away. And if yeah, I was so win, win from her point of view, yeah. And if I were Bob yeah, Schaefer, I, I would pay her that. off. I would pay her off to you know to to end this surprise attack, uh, and I would pay her off today and just end it, right? Uh, that's what I would do. And then I would now figure out, okay, I've got a real enemy here. This isn't Kathleen Kennedy, right? This is somebody who will come at my throat, right? And not just try to backstab me. This is because this isn't backstabbing. That's the old, that's the old Lucasfilm way, right? You can outsmart that. This is somebody coming at your throat in a town where, where being aggressive and straightforward is frowned upon. Right. Mm -hmm. I know because I'm aggressive and straightforward and that really pisses people off. It's why I got fired from Disney, because I'm aggressive and straightforward and, and told the truth. There were no where the idea is if you had a problem, you would backstab this guy, backstab that guy, whisper about this person and then you achieve your objective. That's how Disney worked. I wouldn't play that game. It didn't help me out and ultimately didn't help the show because I left and the show wasn't renewed. Right. And so but that's the one thing that Disney doesn't know how to handle is a direct frontal attack. It doesn't know how to handle that. So Chapek has, you know, he's now been taught a lesson that you're dealing with an adversary that's going to be a thorn in your side for a while now. This is just the beginning. I think this will get settled out real fast. But now we this is where my predictions come in. Now we're going to get ready for round two of uh, of Feige versus Chapek. That's coming. This was the this was the opening salvo, and it's a big one. This is Pearl Harbor, right? Uh, you know, and so that's this is a big one. Now there's going to be a now there's going to be a counterattack, uh, and then we're going to see more. And because we see that Mr. Chapex uses the press, this is going to be we're going to start seeing. And this is my prediction. I'm putting on my seer hat. Okay, I'm putting on my seer hat. Wait one second. Wait so one second. Up. Okay, so I, let me give it. you what you predict. This is my this is my prediction about what's coming in the next stage of this Marvel versus Disney Feige versus Chapek war. Uh, I think number one, I think they will settle out with, with Scarlett Johansson in the very near future. They would be extremely stupid not to. Uh, if she chooses not to settle, that means that there is something even deeper going on here, where it isn't about money; it's about ousting Chapek, right? If you hear that they've made settlement offers and the settlement offers collapse, that means this isn't actually about money. This is about Marvel itself attempting to remove Bob Chapek by letting this go to trial, right? And 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 Scarlett Johansson thinking that she'll get a longer term benefit to her career by having Kevin Feige essentially take over uh, take over the company or be its most powerful person, even if it doesn't have the title of the CEO, right? Uh, and so that's prediction one. So if you if this doesn't get settled out, this means they're going for the juggler. They want to remove Chapek using this lawsuit. That's number one. Okay. But let's assume that it gets settled out. Let's assume that Ms. Ms. Johansson will take a fifty million dollar or sixty million dollar payout and get out of this game. All right. So that's salvo one. So what's going to be salvo two? If I'm Bob Chapek, what I would do is I would start my now very well honed leaking to the press strategy of all the things that Mr. Feige may have done wrong over the course of his career. Now you got to go after him personally because it's a personal attack. And it will lead to, you know, there's a lot of, let's just say, I, I will say this much. 
there's a lot of questions about why Captain Marvel got so much attention and why Brie Larson got so much attention and why her movie of a character nobody cared about when people were deeply invested in Black Widow, why she got a movie years in advance of uh, of a Scarlett Johansson who's a beloved actress and a beloved character and why Scarlett Johansson wasn't, you know, why her movie was treated in the shabby fashion, it was treated over a period of several years. So I won't address those. I will only say that there's a lot of questions about the dynamics between the people involved as to why certain people were uh, pushed forward, others were not pushed forward. If I were Bob Shapek, I would attempt to bring out some ugly things about those dynamics and put them in the press about, you know, is Mr. Feige making creative choices or is he making personal choices and favoritism towards actors that he prefers, right? And we can leave it at that. But uh, that's what I would do if I were him. Uh, and I would start attempting to take away his sheen. He didn't have to do that with Kathleen Kennedy. She had already lost her sheen after The Last Jedi and Solo and the disasters that followed. She had done that to herself. It was just about getting her out of the system where she was constantly stabbing you know, people in the back and, and to achieve her objectives and ruining the work of others. And she had already lost her public sheen. Mr. Feige has his public sheen. So the next step is, if you're Bob Chapek and you think Feige is coming for your crown, the next step is to take away his public sheen. So you look out for articles that are coming out that are, you know, suggest all kinds of uh, malfeasance as a leader and all kinds of personal, uh, you know, shady stuff that will be there to hurt his reputation and and you may even see them beginning to to back the fans who are critics of uh of where this new stage of marvel is going you know because mr chapek has already aligned himself probably i'm sure not probably for selfish reasons of his own power he has aligned himself with the fans of of star wars against the corruption of star wars and if now for self-preservation he may have to align himself with the critics of Marvel uh, as well. And so you'll start seeing more and more, you know, criticisms of Marvel's choices. The articles that we saw, the 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 victory article that we saw in the Atlantic, where it's stating that, that uh, you know, Jean Favreau is the visionary that's going to fix Star Wars, you know, suggesting Kathleen Kennedy wasn't the visionary that, that and, and actually made it worse, right? When you see, start seeing stuff like that coming out, then maybe Mr. Feige has lost his creative mojo. When that starts appearing in the press, you will know this attack on the sheen is beginning. You will know that it's a personal attack because that's the only way that he can take out Feige is to first take away his his power with the public, right? And then you, you move in for the kill. You can't do it with the guy's beloved ca figure in the public, which he still is for the majority of public, right? So that is my prediction that that's going to get very ugly and very personal and it's going to be very different than the kind of strategy that was done on uh, Lucasfilm where Miss Kennedy was never mentioned. This is going to be personal on Feige because we already saw it with the Business Insider where he's brought up as being a, a thorn in, uh, in Chapek's side and being unhappy with Chapek's choices. That's already been put in motion. So now it's going to have to be, this whole war is going to be personas. And that's it's going to be the biggest scandal in Hollywood for the immediate future until some of the big scandal erupts, right? But the, the fact that these two people are going to go after each other publicly and with their names, that's something Hollywood hasn't seen in a long time, and it's going to get very interesting. It is indeed. Uh, it is indeed going to be very interesting to see how all of that is going to play out. Uh, so, so you think then that... Uh, uh, JPEG actually might be happy to see Feige leave after something like this. Uh, oh, I think he wants him out, right? I think he wants him out today. Yeah. I, th I think he wants him out today, you know. And so we're, we're going to have to see what happens. Yeah, because who do you think that he would promote to take over Marvel instead? His son, which is already inside. Yeah, well, his son doesn't have it. No, I mean, I think, I think that's too far down the line to plan that out. In the same way, we don't know who's going to officially take over Lucasfilm. Uh, from from Kathleen Kennedy, uh, you know, that's that's too far down the game. Right now, you don't worry about the successor. Right now, you gotta mortally wound your adversary. Then you you start putting successor plans in motion. Yeah, and uh, then we were just alerted by Lady Ruskolin. Okay. That deadline just dropped a new article okay, on Disney. Up? Okay, wow. let's see what's up. Let's uh, let's go and check out Deadline right away and uh, see what uh, what they got. Um, 
Oh, oh, breaking news. Oh, here we go. I'm going to put this news? up right away. Oh, good what stuff. You what you got? Uh, just give me one second here. Yeah. And yeah. we're going to share share the screen here. Uh, and we'll put it up because uh, this is a hard counterattack. And this is a response from Scarlett Johansson's camp to okay. Disney's response. Okay, this is interesting. Let's see what's going on. Yeah, let's see. I'm just going to find the article here. Just yeah. give me one second to share. Okay. I have it, of course. Uh, yeah, here we go. So wasn't it that the line article we just had, or oh no? Uh, no, no, no. This is a, this is an update. This is an update. Okay. It came okay. just as for uh, 20 minutes ago. So the war's uh, continuing. Right. What happens? Yeah, uh, Black Widow, Scarlett Johansson's lawsuit. Actress's agent slams Disney for direct attack on her character and leaving talent out of streaming profit equation. Get some of that crap really? off the screen. <laughs> so that's, that Brian Lord, the most powerful agent in Hollywood. Remember, I just used his name, right? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and look at the title, The Direct Attack. I said that a minute ago. <laughs> I literally said that one minute ago. This is going to be a war of direct attacks. That's not yeah. how Hollywood works. This is really interesting. <laughs> Indeed, because let's read the article here. Uh, CAA co-chairman and Scarlett Johansson's agent, Brian Lord, issued a statement Friday in response to Disney's harsh slam against the Black Widow actress in her breach of contract lawsuit with the Burbank studio. On Thursday, Disney shamed the two-time Oscar nominee by saying her lawsuit showed callous disregard for the pandemic, the latter of which has been the studio's excuse for taking Black Widow day and date in theaters and on Disney Plus premiere. Disney also outed her $20 million salary for the film, which it claims that coupled with Disney Plus monies of the MCU titled, significantly enhanced her ability to earn additional compensation. Below is Lord's statement. Now, that would be her CEA agent. And like the yeah, second but Brian Lord, name I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the guy who likes to see himself. This is a war of kings here. This is insane. Think about this. This is Brian Lord, the guy who sees himself as the king of Hollywood agents versus Bob Chapek, the king of Hollywood studios, you know, with Scarlett Johansson, the queen of actresses. This is insane. This is, this is really interesting. <laughs> and then the statement reads, I want to address the Walt Disney Company statement that was issued in response to the lawsuit filed against them yesterday by our client, Scarlett Johansson. They have shamelessly and falsely accused Mrs. Johansson of being insensitive to the global COVID pandemic in an attempt to make her appear to be someone they and I know she isn't. Scarlett has been Disney's partner on nine movies, which have earned Disney and its shareholders billions. The company included her salary in their press statement in an attempt to weaponize her success as an artist and businesswoman, as if that were something she should be ashamed of. Scarlett is extremely proud of the work that she and all of the actors, writers, directors, producers, and the Marvel creative team have been part of for well over a decade. The suit was filed as a result of Disney's decision to knowingly violate Scarlett's contract. They have very deliberately moved the revenue stream and profits to the Disney Plus side of the company, mm -hmm. leaving artistic and financial partners out of their new equation. That's it, pure and simple. Disney's direct attack on her character and all else they implied is beneath the company that many of us in the creative community have worked with successfully for decades. Johansson's breach of contract lawsuit was filed in Los Angeles Superior Court yesterday and, the, and is the first public slam by a Hollywood star against a studio that's reaping money by crushing theatrical windows at the expense of talent in exchange for spiking its stock price for the sake of its newfound streaming service. That part right there, that was obviously written straight from CAA, uh, as are most things from Deadline Hollywood. Like they, so, yeah. so easy to well, be a one of their journalists. I mean, yeah, the trades are just, you know, doing press releases. They'll, they'll do a press release on whatever the response to that is. There's going to be a response to that as well. Yeah. 
Oh, it must be easy being a uh, journalist working for Deadline Hollywood, just print and that will publish what you already get uh, pre-written. And then they talk about Disney's uh, Disney stock price. Uh, that continued. The actress contract with Disney called for a wide theatrical release, much like other MCU movies. Reports have it that Johnson lost more than 50 million in Disney's dynamic window experiment, which yielded a first weekend global PVOD and theatrical weekend for Black Widow of 218 million. Black Widow will be lucky to hit 350 worldwide at the box office, a low gross for an MCU title, which typically churns out of late over a billion. The National Association of Theatre Owners slammed Disney during the pick's second weekend for moving PVOD money forward. All of this means, in the end, that Black Widow will make less money in its total revenue cycle. Universal's F9, which has respected the theatrical window, looks to do double what Black Widow does at the global box office. It is no secret that Disney is releasing films like Black Widow directly onto Disney Plus to increase subscribers and thereby boost the company's stock price. Yeah. And that and that it's hiding behind COVID-19 as a pretext to do so. Johansson's attorney, John Berlinski of Kasov, blah, 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 said in a yeah. statement Thursday. So, yeah, now we're back to repeating the original lawsuit. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this is getting real ugly, right? I said that. I said that. This is what I think. One yeah, of like minutes ago. Friends. Yeah, I, I mean, where my prophecy came true within... Five minutes. <laughs> actually, actually, yeah, actually, yeah. Actually, uh, I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty already, impressive. Yeah, yeah, I'll take. I'll take the. Said. I'll take the win on that. <laughs> so this is getting real ugly. They, you know, so Chapek needs to settle this out because this isn't a fight he needs to be fighting. You know, this is. This is. This is. You know, Feige is a, re a really dangerous adversary. This, I mean, this isn't a you. This isn't a fight the champion should be fighting. This is. This is. He's got to settle this out right now. Yeah, but this was an attack on Chapek, though. I mean, this is this is Marvel and uh, and uh, Scarlet striking back at Chapek. Yes, correct. Uh, so this is and this is. I mean, look, this is all happening in twenty four hours. The town. You know, I do think that that Chapek was blindsided. Uh, you know, I, he didn't see this coming. The reactions reveal he didn't see this coming. These are all people. He knows all these people. I'm sure he was on the phone with Brian Lord yesterday. I'm sure he was on the phone with him. It makes no sense. And then this morning, you know, we have Mr. Lord making this aggressive statement. I personally think they're they're all if I instinctively they are already negotiating an out for this but they've got to keep their public stances right for there because you know ca can't ever be seen as as backing down they've got to portray themselves as the most powerful people in the industry right and so uh so that so they're going to keep doing these public volleys until they settle this out uh, let's see if my prediction is right if i think god willing this is going to get settled out within one week let's see i could be wrong let's let's see if this prediction happens a week from now we do a video and this gets settled out uh, that this thing gets resolved. Uh, if not, then this is this is a major effort to disrupt JPEG's power. And if it's not settled out, yeah, well, we'll see what happens with it. I'm sure that CAA will also appreciate some kind of settlement because they get their oh, agents yeah. fee as well. So they'll yeah, at least yeah, if it's fifty million bucks, they'll get five million bucks right there for for a couple of days worth of work. So not bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, so of course. All right. Uh, with uh, with that uh, piece of broke, uh, breaking news behind us, thank you, Lady Ruskalin, for you. for pointing that uh, out to us. That's brilliant. Well, wow, like you're really pulling your weight this stream. Let's put it that way. <laughs> she gave a hundred pounds at the beginning of the stream. She's given us this incredible article. So God bless her. Bring her on at some point if if she likes coming on. I'd love to hear from her because she's helping us. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, meanwhile, we're hearing from Miladin077, who says for mm -hmm. uh, for $5, yeah. thank you, Mr. Pasha, for your insight. Keep up the great work, guys. Yes, we uh, we intend to, and this is a story that we're going to we're going <laughs> to follow. It's funny, like when we booked you earlier um, in the week, Kamran, for today, yeah. we didn't know what we were going to talk about. It was like, I'm sure something is going to come up over the course oh, yeah. of the week. Oh yeah. oh yeah, this is, this is, this is we. I think we 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 booked it on Sundays. We had no idea what was coming. 
<laughs> but like, oh, I'm sure there'll be something. And lo and behold, there we go. And Gran Wasu says, this is open warfare until the end. The losing party will stay on the battlefield covered in blood. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, is, this, yeah, and, this, uh, this is, this is, there's not going to be the kind of accolades resolution here that's going to happen with Kathleen Kennedy. You know, I wouldn't make a comment of that. I think Miss Kennedy's watching and laughing right now. She's watching and laughing <laughs> because these two are going to kill each other. <laughs> They're going to wound each other really badly. She's going to walk away with a bunch of Oscars next year for Lifetime Achievement Awards. <laughs> she's like, she's like, oh, I, I outsmarted all you guys. You you boys just killed each other while I'm walking away being praised by the industry. This is going to be the funny, funniest twist of this town, right? Because she had to deal not only with Chapek breathing down her neck she had to deal with constant comparisons to kevin feige you think it didn't it didn't it rankle her that people were saying that her uh you know that 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 she was not as good a leader of a studio as mr feige is she's a creative visionary as mr feige is you think that isn't rankling of course it rankled her and watching these two men who have been th this annoyance in her life you know, and have probably and have sort of shuffled her on the way out, <laughs> watching them destroy each other has got to be really entertaining for Miss Kennedy. <laughs> it's really yeah. it's twenty years of this town; it still blows me away. <laughs> and speaking of uh, better than TV or better, really entertaining, Elijah Snow even says this: "This is better than TV." So yeah. <laughs> Well, breaking things live here. So, but, yeah, but I want to say awesome. there's something deeper here happening. Yes, there is. There's another layer that's even deeper than a personal war between Bob Chapek and Kevin Feige. There's one more layer, which is that this is about an industry war about the future of theaters. That's what this is. This is that's why Brian Lord is getting involved at this level, right? The head of CA, because this is about whether we're going to have theaters as the predominant form of movies moving forward as a culture. Right. And because of the events that have happened the last year, you know, we theaters have been injured, but they're not down and they're fighting back because already streaming was taking away their power. And then the events of the past year, when they were forcibly shut by the governments, made them weaker. And yet the public responded. Yeah, it, it was the public that saved AMC. It was the public that bought AMC shares, right? Even though all the industry analysts were saying these are worthless. They don't worth anything. I was like, oh, you guys will buy worthless stock all the time as part of, you know, Andre, you work in the financial industry. Most most trades are are part of a strategy and not part of any fundamentals, right? Every yeah. single one of them. Yeah. It's not about like, well, I think this is the earnings. It's not about the earnings. It's about whatever your play is with the technicals and this yeah. analysis and your and your fund portfolio. It's this is, this is one thing that I can't say. Every single time uh, someone point something is in an article, whether it be especially if it comes from the financial, uh, some kind of financial uh, newspaper, there's always a hidden meaning with it. If, for instance, you have like some trader that comes out and says that oh, sugar is really going to skyrocket, like all everything is like here now, everyone go buy sugar, this is your tip. The reason that is there is because that trader is invested and he's doing everything he can to make sure as many other people may go and buy it to drive the price up maybe because he knows that fuck this thing is going to fail and i need something to drive the price up like stuff like that happens yeah. all, all the time you know this is it's it's fascinating to me and so th this is uh this layer is 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 a conflict about the future of an industry that's playing out with these two people. You know, in my novels, I'm gonna do a little plug here, my novels, and you know, Mexican Iron Man's read, read my novel on the crusade, Shadow of the Swords. There, there's a line where the two great leaders, they fought each other throughout the war and they've never met. And the you know, Saladin, the Muslim King versus Richard the Lionheart. And historically, we don't know that they ever met, but there was one night where both of them disappeared and, and neither of their camps knew what happened. And they probably had a private meeting in the middle of the war, which ended the war, right? And so I dramatized that, that private meeting. And when they have that meeting, uh, they speak to each other. And ultimately, they're, you know, Richard the Lionheart just wonders over, you know, all all these people that we've killed, millions of people take the world history, and it's just us two in this room together, right? And Saladin says to him, uh, what, what is any war but a conflict between two men? Because two men, you know, ultimately two leaders are represent the focal point of their civilizations and we're having a civilizational war here 
about the future of Hollywood, about the future of our entertainment, about the fundamental nature of filmmaking that goes back to the beginning of this craft a uh, hundred years ago, to, to Thomas Edison developing this uh, this technology, to the Lumiere brothers creating modern filmmaking, uh, and then the industry that's created in Los Angeles. You know, this is a moment where the future of the industry is being is being battled out between these two egos. <laughs> it's remarkable. Indeed, and also on that note, Mexican Iron Man just ch chimes in. That scene in Swords is freaking awesome. So yes, kudos to your book it right there, Kamran. I, I yeah. love it. Right yeah. <laughs> it is a good scene. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so it's a. Uh, this is an amazing series of events. I think no one's going to be talking about Lucas for, for a while. And then Guy's is like, I'm just going to get out of here. I'll see y'all later, suckers. <laughs> I'll take my words and go. You guys find it out. We're going to be talking about this for a while to come because whatever happens with this lawsuit, it's the first salvo in the war. Yeah, well, and it's just, it's seeming like we're just starting to see the cracks and what's going on. And I just find it interesting that, I mean, Iger went with Chapek. I mean, ultimately it was his call, right? To go with Chapek. And I, I'm trying to to stretch to see why he would do that and then go to the extremes he has now to make JPEG look so bad. And I mean, you can't even, it's almost like it's not even speculatory. Like the dude yeah. came back in and took charge again, right after he gave power over to him. Now we're seeing this kind of crap. Yeah, that was papers. a quarter slap in the face. Exactly. And you're not going to sit here and have stuff coming out and in, in, in like the insider and all these other uh, trade papers that aren't necessarily entertainment related. If there isn't something going on, and you're not going to have Scarlett Johansson, who's arguably one of the biggest actresses in Hollywood right now, suing the biggest company publicly. Like, I mean, this isn't just like, I can't believe it got to this point. This is one of those things that that's what I'm so surprised. I'm not surprised that she's pissed. I'm not surprised that she wants her money. And I'm not surprised that Disney would pull something underhanded like this. I'm just surprised it got to the point where all this shit's in the headlines. Because normally these, these guys have more control over this, right? Well, that's because the industry yeah. is going through a, a epic change. Let an it epic burn! Change the I'm not using the word EPIC, which is what my novels are. It's EPOC, an epical. This is a moment of history that we're watching here, uh, where, the, where the entire future of, of a craft, of an art, and of an industry is being determined. And uh, that's why this isn't going to get resolved that easily. Well, I hope this is the beginning of the turning point we've been waiting for. I hope this is, you know, we start to see them, you know, eat themselves so then we can just, you know. I think we're seeing the beginning of it right <laughs> yeah. now with this. Burn but it all on with that, while, we're, yeah. while we're still on the topic of, uh, of Kamran's books, D. Bud Martin pointed out that uh, one of his classic Super Chats was pretty relevant right now. And he says... Been reading Cameron's book, Shadow of the Swords. Great mm. historical fiction. What would be his dream casting for the three lead characters? Well, I had a dream casting that didn't work out because of a tragedy. Uh, there was a moment, I because the novel is based on an original screenplay. I wrote the screenplay first, right, and novelized it to make it the novel. Uh, and for a brief moment, uh, I had the interest of uh, Shekhar Kapoor, the director of Elizabeth, right? After he had made Elizabeth, it was something I was like, wow, my God, that's incredible. Introduced Kate Blanchett to the world. Uh, and he had uh, wanted to do it. Uh, and he had just made uh, The Four Feathers, which was perhaps not as good a movie as Elizabeth, but it, it starred Heath Ledger. And he, and he said to Heath, uh, could you want to play Richard the Lionheart on this movie I got here in front of me? And Heath was at the time 25 years old, which Richard Lionheart was a young man when he did this. When Saladin was, was, was an old man, and Richard was like 25 and young and impetuous. And Heath would have been perfect for it. And Heath Ledger said, yeah, I'm, that sounds, I'll do anything with you, Shaker. I love working with you. And that sounds like a fun, uh, Richard the Lionheart? You know, yeah, that sounds good. And then he passed away. So uh, the I think the vision that I had had, at least for the two characters of uh, of uh, Richard the Lionheart, would have been Heath Ledger. And I had written the character, as anyone's reading the novel, there's a female Jewish spy who's working for Saladin, who's really the central character. It's her point of view. And I had written that with Natalie Portman in mind. So this, this you know, the script was written 20 years ago. Uh, but, you know, and Saladin... You know, at the time, I, I would have been like, you know, lots of great Muslim actors. And the how do we be like, I don't want who are these Arab guys. I don't want that. And, you know, and they, they would have cast somebody else. But uh, but at least those two actors, I think, would have been my ideal for those roles. But, you know, time right. is and with that, let's get back to the classic super yes. chats here. Uh, Legion Steve says for five British pounds, 
Andre, your Conan stream with Critical Drinker was awesome. And anyone who hasn't seen it should check it out on Critical Drinker after hours. So yeah, that was two fun hours yesterday uh, with me and the drinker. So check it out on Critical Drinker after hours. And then we have Lars Hansen, who says for 100 Danish krona, seen from outside, Hollywood is determined to destroy itself. If it's not wokeness, then it's greed, what Scarlett Johansson lawsuit is all about. And yeah, I'm pretty sure he feels that even stronger now after everything that we've uh, gone Well, if Hollywood won't destroy today. itself, though. I mean, there's always going to be the human need for filmmaking as an art. Uh, Hollywood still remains the place where most of the resources for big-scale filmmaking is centered, and the most talented crews uh, are centered. And I'm saying, you know, you can have actors from all over the world, but the most talented crews really happen to be in the industry here. So if you want to make an excellent movie, it's not just the actors. You have to have the most incredible stunt coordinator. You have to have the most incredible editors. The crews are here. So Hollywood will survive this. What we're watching is a transformational moment where the future of the industry will be determined. But there will be in Hollywood. And greed is the is the mode. You know, Andre works in finance. You know, is it's what they it's what they said in the movie Wall Street. Your greed is good, right? Greed forces evolution. That's what's happening. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, yeah, uh, we just have to get to the point where, 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 uh, where they're funded by pure greed rather than ideology, because greed is what makes them do what the audience wants. Ideology is what makes them cause greed is our greed is our savior in this industry. Uh, actually, yes, Gordon Gecko was right. Greed he is, right. for lack of a better term, good because that is how you can align the interests of people with power with the interests of us normal people and and that's why and we can do a little side thing here that's why ideolo ideologies such as marxism and uh, these don't work because they believe that greed is something that is foreign to the human condition and can be transcended whereas whenever they're implemented they're implemented through greed, and you inevitably have an elite that greedily takes power and suppresses everyone else to retain that power because that's inherent to the human condition. Everyone wants to maximize their own life. That's the basic, you know, art of survival. It's the instinct of the human race to survive, and everyone wants to maximize the food they have and the reproductive partners they have. That's basic biology, and uh, and so greed is uh, greed is good because it is part of the human condition. Whether we can use that impulse to actually better the entire race is the question. Right, and that's that's the challenge we face, you know. And but we're watching that here, and I think ultimately this battle of egos and greed will lead to a betterment of the industry. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, then uh, we also had, in reference to your books, Rambam three thousand said for five pounds. That sounds like a Valerio Massimo Manfredi's Lost Army. Told from the point of view of a Syrian girl who joins the army as Xenophon's lover. Yeah, well, Manfredi is an incredible, incredible author. I'm very familiar with the works. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an honor to even be compared with him. He's one of the great writers of historical fiction. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then going back to the classics one more time. Mm -hmm. uh, Dark King wonders, is Mexican Iron Man suit powered by, guacam by a guacamole reactor? Oh. Also, Tom needs to check out Leo Muraccioli's cover of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles theme. Yeah, I think Actually, he shared I, that with me on Twitter. I, I yeah. heard that somewhere before. Did they use that in a game or a cartoon or something? Because I've heard it before. It's not the first time I've heard it. Well, you might have heard it on YouTube because like mm. Leo Mura, Muraccioli, like I really should have known how to pronounce his name, seeing as he's based in Norway. Uh, I just never actually heard it pronounced. I've only seen it written. He has some pretty awesome. Well, covers. I watched the video this morning, and yeah, I mean, I do. I never watched that video before, so I swear it's been used somewhere officially. Like I've heard that version before, but yeah, it's pretty kick-ass. Thank you for sending me that. Yeah. And Hypergiver Two says, after the defeat of the Vocostos, they have proved the justice of our culture. Now go and rest our heroes. Yeah, we got that one. I said not quite yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then. Well, let's see, Golgo13 said for five dollars, well, this is, doesn't age well. Gentlemen, it is popcorn time. Doubt the suit goes far. Odds of settlement and silence high. But who does not like a good clown show? Oh, you're getting your clown show. That is uh, uh, for yeah. certain on this well, one. 
Well, like I said, Gogo, and he's a, he's a great supporter, so thank you. Well, well, that's what I expect. I expect this to be settled, but I expect this to just be round one. You know, it's it's a truce. It'll be it'll, it'll be getting one warrior off the field, but the general is still fighting. So I think that will be round. Uh, you know, round two will be interesting. Yeah, and uh, Stephen Otten said, "Hail Andre, Tom, Commandant, Wrenches, and Midnighters. Thanks for keeping the fate." And then Michael Miller, yeah, he we asked, they got him this one already. The Wall says for ten dollars, thank you so much, Kamran. I have to ask your opinion on so many in Hollywood not being able to see the woke in their own product. They try to point out the ways it is not woke, ignoring the way it blatantly is. Yeah, what is up with that kind of gaslighting, Kamran? Why do they do that? Well, it's because we're all in an echo chamber, right? So we don't know what is woke and not woke because we're all repeating the same mantras to each other. You know, I was on a call this week uh, on a project I'm doing with with various players, a director, and they're you know producers and executives, and they're all wonderful people. They're people that I'm excited to be working with. But the first few minutes of the call was, you know, everyone going through all the mantras of, you know, how lockdowns are good and how X this on that or medical issues, and everyone's repeating the standard mantras of the of the official line on the events that we're all going through. I just sat there smiling because mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I have opinions that perhaps don't fit with the majority of the industry right now and a lot of the events that are happening in the world. But I'm not going to argue with them about it. I, I got work to do. But everyone in the town was repeating the same mantras. It was almost like a ritual, right? We have to go through it before we can get to business, right? Uh, to talk about politics and world events in a certain way. It, it was like everyone has to say that. It's a small talk. It's like weather talk. And we're reaffirming what the official mantra of the industry is. And so no one knows that they're woke here. They think they're normative people. They think that the language that they're using, when, when they hear everyone using Latinx, they go on board. They don't think about whether Latinx is a real word used by Latinos and whether it's offensive to Latinos. It never even occurs to them. They're just regurgitating whatever the words are of the industry of the day. Whoever the politician of the day is that they support, they go with it. Because everyone's just trying to get work. Everyone's just trying to survive and not make enemies and get their next gig. And they just repeat what they're hearing. So nobody's thinking that they're woke because they're not really that woke. When you actually ask people in their practical lives, they're just normal people. You know, they don't actually, they're not these weirdo activists setting fire to buildings. They're, they're just trying to make money and well, they're trying to hang out with movie stars. So they're, they're not woke in their own minds. I was going to say, can I th throw something out there? The act of being woke isn't necessarily what they try to make it appear to be. It's more so basically the fear. Mm -hmm. Being woke means you're afraid. You're afraid of saying or doing something that will offend others and or cause you to be canceled. That's what being woke is. And and that and what that entails is basically being PC cranked up to 11. Uh, and that means not only are you making sure that your dialogue is, is matching a certain possible other person's feelings, but you you it's your job to make sure that you're the pc police right to yeah. go out there and if you hear somebody say something or do something that could even, even remotely come close to persecuting or making somebody else a victim you've got to be that white knight right there and that's where the sjw part of it comes in and i know andre hates that term but again all these things feed into the other and it's this overwhelming need to to seem virtuous and or be a victim one or Correct. the other and 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 uh, you're right, Dom. And again, why? It's only for a practical purpose, which is I yeah. want to get my next job. That's it. That That's all. Just to appear virtuous and or a victim. Yeah, but, but yeah, but, but again, virtuous and victim for itself in the industry is meaningless. It's to get your work, right? You know, you know that all you want is to get your next thing. And that's all anybody wants, except for a few people who are like, I would like to be the richest person in this town and everyone else be my slave. And I believe this ideology will allow me to achieve that objective. That's a few people in the club, right? Everyone else is just trying to get by, man. And they're just going to repeat whatever the official word is out of fear of not being in the, uh, you know, in the safe you know, group that can get them work. Look at me, you know, I've had my ups and downs in my careers. I've had incredible moments and I've had long periods of crap because I just can't do it. I'm a straight, that's why like on this call, I just sat there keeping my mouth shut because my 
volcano is erupting saying, hey, you know, this is all crap. Why are we saying this crap? But I couldn't say it because I actually do need to get this project done. I need to get it done and I'm not going to change their points of view. So I just keep my mouth shut and the truth will eventually reveal itself over time. And then they'll, whatever is going to be of value to the, to the people's careers, they will go with that at that moment. So because I know it's not coming from a profound place of, yeah. of religious commitment because I'm a religious guy and I've made certain commitments, right? I know these people are just saying stuff to get work. That's all it is. Well, and it's funny because uh, Six sent me this. Thank you so much to uh, mm -hmm. this re is referring to the super yeah, chat. I saw that. I saw that. Um, from Mecca J. And yeah, uh, the thing about this uh, headline here is you can see Peter Safran's response right in the headline or the post headline or whatever you call that, the byline or whatever. whatever what is this called? The uh, whatever it's called. See, I don't even remember. I'm so like out of it this morning. I need in, to ingress. Uh, there's a Latin name for it. Uh, yeah, I can't I remember it. Remember the fancy name, fancy name. Yeah. Anyway, point being, uh, ingress then. Yeah, he's like, pure, pure fan pressure isn't a reason to change the casting in Aquaman 2, referring to Amber Heard. But yet, Warner had no problem bowing to the pressure of, you know, a bunch of rings over Johnny Depp. When it came to uh but, yeah, but because it's those are, again, that's just a, that's just a, that's just an answer to to make stupid people happy, right? Because uh, the people that support Amber Heard are largely stupid people, and then they'll regurgitate that mantra, right? Uh, because if you think about it, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But again, it came down to a couple of things were happening. One is when all of this began, the Me Too stuff was coming out, and everyone is afraid of being on the wrong side of that. So if a woman says, this guy beat me, he did all these terrible things to me, you just presume it is true, right? Even though people kind of knew Ms. Heard's reputation in the industry. <laughs> that like, you know, this person, a little bit of a, you know, I've heard, I'm not saying this, Ms. Heard, if you want to sue me, I've heard people say to me, say, this person's a bit of a psychopath, right? <laughs> so, yeah, and I have that t-shirt. It's And that's what people have said to me. I don't know her personally, but that's what people have said to me. And, uh, and yet people knew that. So... But nobody, again, everyone just want to keep their job. Everyone's like, okay, a woman coming out claiming this guy, a white male did this to me. I just want to keep my job. Man. Yeah, get rid of Johnny Depp. Get rid of Johnny Depp. Get rid of Johnny Depp. And and then they got on that train, and now they look like a bunch of jackasses. Most people in this town know that Johnny Depp isn't that guy. Most people in this town know what Amber Heard is. People at Warner Brothers know the truth of it. But they're like, what are they going to do? They go against this thing. They, they they look like jackasses, which they are. I mean, it's the emperor has no clothes. We all know look like jackasses. And if they're in the middle of a lawsuit, if they come out and say that you know they made the wrong choice, they 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 fear losing millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. Right? There's lawsuits happening right now. So everyone's got to keep saying this thing that nobody believes. And you know, and then again, Ms. Heard has leverage over people, just like you know, Ms. Kennedy did. There's there's a reason that powerful people, even if the whole system started saying Amber Heard was the was lying here and and Johnny Depp was a victim of a of a narcissistic abuser, if that's what the system starts saying, some of these people will still back her because she's got stuff on them, because that's her reputation. <laughs> she's the kind of person that gets stuff on people. That's a reputation. Is it even I heard really that time. far anymore, Cameron? Do you really, I mean, I, 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 now five years ago, I would have believed you. Okay. But I've gotten to this point where I simply think that all she has on Hollywood is what's between her fucking legs. That's well, all. that's enough. That's, that's enough. To I don't think people. she has that's any enough. compromising pictures. If anything, there's probably more compromising evidence out there against her. But it doesn't matter because it just falls on deaf but ears. That, that's that's how enough. we see that in, the last in this years. environment. Yeah. It's enough. It's in in this environment. It's enough to uh to end. I mean, it's always been enough. You know, the, look, we are a puritanical culture, and uh, and the the joke of it is we all know the Hollywood casting couch last prostitution game. We all know it. Everyone in Hollywood knows it. It's still going on. It's intensified under lockdown by some by the people who are talking the loudest about Me Too are the ones participating in this in this in this prostitution game, right? And so you're having that happening right now. And it's but we are this we've always been this weirdo sort of sex shamed culture going back to the Puritans. And so that's the one sword you can use to bring anybody down in the society. I'm not so sure, you know, you go to France, you know, people having affairs, people doing that, it doesn't really change your social standing, right? The president, Mitterrand, can have, you know, his his mistress and his wife standing with him at a, at a press speech, right? As I saw stuff like that in the old days, right? And so that's kind of their culture. American culture has got the pilgrims and the Puritans. Well, it's all kind of similar to what we're seeing here. We've seen now twice in the last year, Disney has tried to pretend that they're, you know, pro female stance but yet they 
publicly, at least in some ways, fired Gina Carano, asterisk, even mm -hmm. though she just didn't have her contract renewed. Yeah. And now we have the situation with uh, uh, Scarlett. I mean, th that she's basically saying, pay me. You didn't pay me. You know, and this is a company that's, you know, supposedly it's all pro-woman. And, and Scarlett is yeah. a real threat. See, that's exactly. the thing. Scar yeah, yeah. Scarlett has a global fan base. She is the highest paid actor. She earned that. And uh, and you know, it's also, I got to, you know, it's funny to me because I have to make a comment about our fandom because I have, in recent days, I've taken some positions that have a little bit been a minority. I liked Black Widow. I still like Black Widow. I, you know, I like Leslie Grace as Batgirl, which is a minority position. I went and saw In the Heights. She blew me away. I couldn't believe how good she was in that movie. I want to see her in this movie. I want to see her as Batgirl, right? But that's a bit of a minority position in the fandom. And I'm going to make a little thing. The fandom just... 10 days ago was all about, was saying smack about Scarlett Johansson. That's all I saw. Oh, well, look how woke she is, blah, 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 blah. You know, she's this, she's a failed crappy movie, whatever. She hates men. And now they're all like, yeah, man, she's fighting against the system. I'm like, guys, at least be consistent. Well, the, well that's, no, no, no. that's only because Disney is the bigger bigger enemy that people wants to see taken down. It's not that, that well, anyone has any real sympathy with Scarlett Johansson. No, but she, but she it's was a, popular. It's like, okay, you are now a useful puppet. So we no, go, but she was go, popular. Girl. Just yeah. two years ago, she was out there saying things like, why can't I play a Japanese character? Yeah. What? Well, why really and people loved her for that. Yeah. And then she became like, Black Widow, she became this icon of whatever the Black Widow, anti-Black Widow narrative is. And now yeah. she's like this icon again. Yeah. I mean, I, don't know. I, well, I agree that that she's uh, that uh, that this lawsuit is actually very, very risky in the, yeah. in a sense. And Etienne Falardeau makes this point. Round two stop <laughs> Emma Stone and Cruella. Oh, oh, oh. And this is something that was broken by know. Screen Rant oh, just it already a few has hours happened. ago. Oh, shit. So no, what happened? What happened? What happened? Kidding. Something new? What happened? Oh, no, no, no. Look at this. Emma Stone reportedly considering suing <laughs> Disney <laughs> over Cruella <laughs> release. <laughs> I got a lot. Not good. Not good. And this is exactly what I predicted was going to happen last night when we brought this up. I said, you watch. This is going to open the floodgates. And, and, and The Rock is going to be next. Yeah. And all these other guys are going to, and, and gals are going to come out of the woodwork now because of this precedent being set. And it has right. everything to do with them dumping this shit on Disney+. Plus. And this is it goes right back to HBO Max and why they were so in such a hot water with legendary and those actors and why they just said fuck it and paid everybody off that's what's going to happen here i bet I well well okay it. here's here's prediction time want to want to give me a prediction for window give me a prediction window yeah go for it so here's my next prediction uh i think uh we're seeing you know we're going to watch hbo max and others watching this and they're going to start making some real quick settlements with all of their actors that might in any way be in this position. And it'll be interesting to see what happens with, with regard to Jungle Cruise this weekend, which also I understand is coming out and streaming as, as well as in theaters. Uh, no, whether it's, it's already out. Uh, you can, you can, uh, you can, uh, we, we do not recommend anyone go out there on the high scenes, but, but, but if one were to venture there, there's a 4K version available. And 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 this 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 channel definitely promotes some wonderful VPNs. <laughs> so uh, yeah. and never to do illegal activity yeah. because you know, yeah. I, like I said, streaming you, when you when you pirate when you, it affects my bottom line. So I never support that, and I never do it personally. But uh, but it'll be interesting to see if in the next twenty four hours we don't see qu quiet uh, you know payoffs to the stars of uh, of Jungle Cruise to make sure that they they do not enter this fray next week yeah because that's the last thing i think disney wants is a headline like dwayne the rock johnson sues disney <laughs> that's not and, and you have to understand about actors let me tell you something this is you know actors have this battle of one level they want to be deeply popular with the public another level they need to be deeply popular with the people who are going to hire them which is you know, directors and producers and studios, right? Okay. And on our third level, they need to be seen as going with the flow, right? So once one actor starts, you know, it's something, others feel the compulsion to jump on board. You know, Emma Stone didn't have the courage to do this on her own. 
maybe I don't know that it even occurred to her to do this because my understanding okay. is this not that great a movie, right? Whereas I do personally think Black Widow is a good movie, as I'll keep saying it. And uh, and it's Scarlett Johansson led this, and now actors will feel like I gotta, you know, I gotta jump on the Me Too. I'm Me Too. I went through this and jump on the train. So that and that's that's something that's just inherent to well, who they who, are as artists. Who who present who who represents her? Is it the same company? This, I would not be surprised if she's also CAA. I'm I looking for it right yeah. now in the article. Yeah. Because uh, because obviously it's not that she decided out like, oh, I feel yeah, brave yeah. right now. I'm going to do it. Let's see if they say anything uh, about it. Yeah, a lot of these. Let, look, a lot of these. Her lawyer or her agency. Yeah, as well, well, you can look yeah. it up on IMDb Pro. I can look it up too. I mean, just tell you a second. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if she's also CAA. It doesn't, but it if doesn't, he isn't, then that means it's spreading. It's. I mean, if it's it, CAA. It doesn't. It's uh, it, yeah, but uh, but I'm also pretty sure that uh, that like like Scarlet and. No, uh, she's Emma's not. She's no more. She's oh, willing more. Okay. Well, then it just be like Scarlet. I used to be a WWE. Gave her a phone call and said, "Hey, yeah. do me a solid." Well, well I, mean, I, I don't even know what this whole ball It's it's the it's the thing that's it's about. You got to be on board the train. When it, well, all the other yeah. actors, every actor supporting Tibet, you got to be on board with Tibet, right? You know, you just got to go with it, right? Because you you know you know you know you, all the stuff that your colleagues are doing, you want to be on the same train as them, right? Because you want to yeah. be popular. This is we all have the high school thing. right here, coming on. Uh, because this this comes from oh. the source here is former The Hollywood Reporter editor Matt Baloney oh, oh, okay. took to his exclusive newsletter what I'm hearing to report that Cruella star is considering a lawsuit of her own. Emma Stone, star of Cruella, is said to be weighing her options, he wrote. Baloney also posts Emily Blunt's name as a talent that could speak out after a wait for it. Jungle oh, Cruise. They got to oh, cut this out. They got to cut it today. They got to pair off today. Disney notoriously difficult to deal with in these circumstances, oh. adding that fellow creatives have been waiting in the wings for someone in the spotlight to speak out. AKA Just as said, come down. Scarlet. Can we do it, Andre? Can we? Can we? Yeah, yeah, go for it. I fucking knew it! Oh! That feels so good. And I gotta give Dark King props, props for this, and I'm gonna totally steal this. The me, hashtag me Sue movement. <laughs> oh, that's that's genius. That that, that, oh, that's genius. Pure genius. That's genius. That's, I mean, that deserves an Oscar right there. That's it perfect. does, sir. Uh, <laughs> Dark King, you gotta give that. Dark King, you are a pure genius with that. You win the infinite for the day. <laughs> and and we actually, I saw. Did Dark King have a, a super chat? I saw in the chat. He say, "Hey, don't don't forget my super chat for Cameron." I saw it fly by. Oh no, so we're, we're going to get to I'll have a quick look at it. We right can't help it. This Let's news see. keeps breaking faster than we can cover it. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know, they, they they need to pay off. Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt today. I think they're they need looking to pay them off today. They need to give them double whatever they probably stole from them, right? And, and because those two are beloved, beloved of the family crowd. Really. Scarlett Johansson is, is not necessarily, you know, yes, Marvel stuff she's is made for family, but she's a sexy woman that us guys like. Emily Blunt is Mary Poppins. You do not want Mary Poppins coming out against Disney. You cannot allow that. Well, and, and this is kind of interesting because, you know, we've been saying this stuff, including you, obviously, Cameron, most of all, has been saying this stuff's been brewing for a while. And a lot of people have said, oh, no, you guys are crazy. But that's why I brought up that goofy picture because this is, you know, we love this picture to use it for different things. But I think this is indicative of, again, Andre, of, you know, what we... Yeah. What we constantly say and here. And whose fault is all this? must be fuming right about now. He oh, must be really of stressed course he's fuming. Of course he's fuming. This, this, this was an attack he didn't see coming, right? Uh, and so, of course, he's nobody saw this coming. But this is, you know whose fault all of this is? This is Bob Iger. He put all these characters in place. <laughs> and he just unleashed this whirlwind. You oh, know, this you is like back what you said earlier, I don't know that he knew who Chapek was when he put him in power. I think he thought he was going to be a yes man so that that uh, that Mr. Iger could continue to be an influential figure behind the scenes like Putin versus his, you know, his whatever. Yeah, his his yeah. And so, you know, so that and then very quickly he figured out that wasn't going to be who this guy is. And it's, and then I think it got real tense last year. And this is something that Iger set in motion because one thing I think it's becoming very clear is Mr. Iger doesn't 
know un, know the people he's putting into positions of power. He didn't really know who Kathleen Kennedy was. He didn't really know who Feige was. He didn't know who JPEG was. And now he put these people in a collision course. It's amazingly bad management. But doesn't Feiger want to retire? That was, sorry, doesn't uh, Iger want to retire here soon? Or just the Nobody wants to retire. He would like to go to his grave being the shadow. Well, he wants him. to go be president, but at the same time, I yeah, don't see him. Know. I don't see him wanting him leaving his legacy in fucking shambles either. Like that's what's happening yeah. right now, in front president of president is done. He's not going to be president, but he's yeah. now like all he cares about is is to fix this this ship where he put you know these characters in place that is blowing up in his face and his legacy. Yeah. So he basically he no. wants to stay, stay on as CEO until the day he dies. And I'll tell you right now, I'm glad I didn't really say too much bad about uh, Scarlett when she was going out on her campaign. I, I rightfully blame Disney as it was. And I hope they use that against them, too. I hope they turn around and say, yeah, you guys were the ones who also pushed this fucking campaign that probably killed half the momentum of the, the Yeah, they got to be careful well. of that. They got to be careful still, of that it's because still they don't want to, because that wouldn't be admitting that the official narrative that everyone is repeating isn't true. And that, I don't know they're going to go there because, well, that, yeah. We may get to that point because well, I mean, it might be well, it might be an aggressive lawyer that does it, but it won't. Well, here's be what I was, well, be. okay. Yeah. Let's sidestep that and go to my other point. Was going to be okay. this, Cameron? Is well, if this goes beyond, of course, this is probably this is me just speaking hypotheticals, yeah. of course, but like because we all know this is probably not going to go beyond. You know, it's good. She's going to get a payment. It's going to go away. This is probably the last we're going to hear about it next week. It's all going to go away, but. If it didn't, and they actually went to court, they get to the point where it's discovery. That means they got to turn over all their actual numbers from Disney Plus, so and, and all their actual ticket sale numbers. That means we're going to actually finally get to see some some books, and that's something we didn't get to see for Captain Marvel. And going back to when this movie came out, because I'm with you, Cameron, they did themselves the biggest injustice in the world by by toting this movie the way they did. Because they added those damn numbers from Disney Plus, they should have never done that. Eighty million dollars for an opening weekend for Black Widow was 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 enough. I mean, it was enough to say we have a hit here, yeah. right? And they should have wrote on that instead. They showed their hand and made us all look. Well, I wouldn't say vindicated, but we, we at least looked like we were onto something with the Captain Marvel mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. because here we go, the same goddamn thing all over again. And not only that, who was it? Variety, Andre, who called them out on it? I can't remember exactly. It was either Variety uh, or Deadline. It was one of the traits. I don't yeah, they even called them out. They're like, why did you do this? Yeah. I, I don't recall who that was right but now. Yeah, they were basically saying the same thing. One we of were. Them. Like they're, they're cooking their books here or something. Not cooking their books, but they're cooking the numbers yeah, to make... They might be cooking their books, too. Well, well, yeah, I want to be careful books. at how I say yeah. this is my point. Yeah. But like, well, yeah. they, were, they, were, they, they had a whistleblower last year or 18 months ago come out and say they were cooking the books on it's a, it's a public record if someone has accused them of that so whatever but we'll move on from that so yeah. yeah yeah let's move on basically the things are getting real here and on that note dash d says i'm not so sure that all these faults can be this stupid or incompetent this smells of publicity and manipulation all right that dude you are wrong People in this industry are this stupid. They are this incompetent. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I know you put nice. Thank you for have your you Canadian five dollars. Thank you very much. But I gotta say, you have you, when you meet some of the people I work with, you're like, are you kidding me? This person couldn't. This person couldn't manage a Wendy's. How are they managing a hundred million dollar production? Right, Andre. What are, what was one of the first things I said to you when we were digging through the emails again for the the. Uh, the uh, Spider-Man and uh, Moji stuff. I, I don't recall. We were both in shock. At, like, well, no, I said, how the fuck did Amy Pascal get to was... this position? She can barely fucking she write. She can't freaking write. <laughs> it's a club. She, she, it's a club. She, 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 she's an alphabet. I'm like, it's I can, a club. Okay. You know, there was, there was a famous studio head, uh, you know, who uh, is, you know, he was infamous for uh, being illiterate, as in he had to have his assistant read him scripts because he could not read or write. I just remembered the exact quote I told Andre. Yeah, that's like, a, that's Amy Pascal. Like, she can't I write. Said, she can't remember write. What I said, Andre, this, this, actually this is what I said. I remember my exact quote. <laughs> Amy Pascal writes like a 12-year-old girl. Oh, yeah. That's what I wrote. No, I think and that's then you're an getting insult to most 12-year-old girls. 
And then you're getting notes on story from that person. Imagine that the, the, the screenwriters will go, oh, what the fuck? There, there's actually uh, a wonderful bo screenwriter book on, the, on, on both on how to be a screenwriter and the crazy industry called, uh, I'm going to get the exact title off Amazon, but it's, uh, it's, ba it's basically uh, you know, how to write movies for, for profit. Right, uh, for for entertainment, I'll get the exact title, but it's about these two screenwriters, uh, who who did like hard, you know, you know, the the what was it, the love bug, you know, the the, the, the the Herbie the love bug remake or whatever. They did their comedy writers. They made some big comedy movies, and they did this sort of expose, and they had stories about getting notes to the Amy Pascal administration, and they're the funniest things I've ever read. Oh, she's a uh, nut bar, like literally. I, like I'll never forget. I'll never forget the email where she had a meltdown because all the projects were falling apart, and then she suggested, well, can't, can't we, like, okay, so fine, our Barbie movie is imploding, and our He-Man movie is imploding. Maybe we can salvage this by doing Barbie versus He-Man. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's how this town works. That's exactly the level of real conversations people are having. And people remember, are having these conversations. With yeah, we did power. that video, so we... we Put that mail in a video. The same one who like, proposed an Aunt May movie as well, folks. Let's not forget that one. That dude's yeah. That's I'd, a, watch yeah. I'd watch an Aunt May. Oh, she she I'd had some of the. I don't know how the fuck she got where she's at, but it answers so many damn questions. All right. Well, so the name of the book is you can get it yeah. off Barnes Nobles or Amazon or go to your bookstore, which is what I always recommend. Writing movies for fun and profit by Thomas Lennon and Robert Ben Grant. Oh, Thomas Lennon. Yeah. Yeah. The book is very practical on how to become a screenwriter and one of the funniest books I've ever read because it's it's just their journey and how all the stupid people they interacted with. It's re and it's I've met all of those types of characters. Yeah. And I like Good this stuff. He Man versus Barbie, I think it would be over kind of quickly, says Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it depends. The current sure. He Man could take on Barbie. Power. Current He-Man couldn't do it. Tila could take her on, but current He-Man don't have the mojo. Well, He-Man would probably just yeah. get manipulated by her. <laughs> yeah. Moving on, also, uh, this is the super chat that we have kind of answered already. Just can okay. bring it up on screen. Mecha oh, J yeah, says yeah, for $20. Yeah. A producer for blah, 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 they won't listen to the public demand. So, yeah, we got that one already. And yeah, I'm yeah, really... We, yeah, we there. really sucks, but there. thanks for the, uh, for, for yeah, the support you know, there. Look, We'll see what happens. I actually believe, God willing, I believe uh, Johnny Depp is going to win the case in America. The case in LA was one uh, in in UK was one of the biggest miscarriages of justice I've ever seen. It was it was it was a joke. Whereas this, the judges here seem to have no patience for for Ms. Heard's team, and they've been shutting her down every step of the way. Uh, and I I think I don't think it's going to settle out. I think. Depp is trying to prove his regain his reputation in the industry. The public still loves him, and so the, he needs a victory to regain it, so that everyone can say, "Well, she was proven to be lying. It wasn't us. We're not anti women. We're not anti white women who are oppressed. We are, you know, we're just going with the court." And he needs that for his own career, and so he's going to fight it all the way to the end. Yeah, well, he absolutely. Has to at this point, and also yeah. on the uh, on the topic of yeah. his uh, XX. Rambam3000 says, I swear the most accurate portrayal of studio executives was the old... I, is this a UK thing? I'm unfamiliar with it. Orange Wednesday? Uh, did we lose volume? Look out. Minor Camerons. Hello? I don't hear Andre either. Hold on a second. Great. Don't you just love technical problems? Anyway, I'm going to keep on talking as if there's no issue because hopefully everything is going to be fine here. Uh, All right, guys, I'm going to sign uh, back on. on. The, the Orange, uh, yeah, okay. the, the camera will rejoin us momentarily here. Anyway, Orange Wednesdays, I remember those. Those were commercials that were in UK cinemas where you had, like, this stupid oh. movie executive that was, uh, that was like, taking pictures, and the only thing he was ever interested in was uh, how can this movie be used to, to sell this phone and games to play on the phone? They were kind of, like stupid commercials but uh, yeah. but yeah rambam 3000 i did my masters in the uk at the time so i recall them 
Okay. Uh, yeah, I've never seen them. Well, you can also go watch the traditional movie, The Player, right? Which, which, yeah. which is, you know, which is a studio exec can get away with murder, right? I mean, it's not inaccurate. Yeah. Or my favorite one is Tom Cruise and Tropic Thunder. Yeah, that's also oh, yeah. that's uh, that's Tom Cruise's best role ever. Like a ninja yeah, stand. Allegedly ninja based on Scott Rudin, who you know, Scott Rudin is an example of. He briefly got attacked for by this town for about a few months ago. You don't hear nothing about it anymore. It all went away. Remember, he yeah. was going to use the villain eyes. You don't hear anything about it anymore. Yeah, he, no, that's one thing. He's laying low and he's still powerful. He's just caping out of the press, and everyone is now focused on other stuff. He knew how to handle it. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Say nothing and uh, do some stuff behind the scenes. And it's going to be fine. Everyone, because yeah. always new drama. Anyone who has any intelligence knows there's always new drama. Weather it out and everyone will forget. And since I hardly ever get to use this. Yes. And lots of money. Play. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been in rooms with people that look like that and act like that, and have that vibe, and you're like, "What is going on here? Am I in a Monty Python skit?" It's yeah. just with that, but we have some more super chats to go through here, and, and then I probably uh, need to find out in, a, in about 15, 20 minutes if that's fair. all right. Let's yeah, I think, I think we can go if we if we hurry. I think we can go through them all in that time. Right. Uh, Darking says for two Australian dollars regarding Feige, bad advice. Or has he genuinely drunk the Kool Aid? Come around, real quick. What do you think? Uh, is uh, is Feige lost, or is he just uh, just trying? You know, bad advice and drinking the Kool Aids together. Because once you, because you just everyone wants to be liked in this town, and once who wants to be going against the loudmouth woke narrative that everyone is saying at every meeting, right? And eventually, when your movies don't reflect what everyone is saying at every meeting, you want to start fitting in. So yes, I'm sure he is getting bad advice, and I'm also sure he wants to fit in. Yeah, and then uh, Naked Fame says maybe, just maybe, people didn't like the movie. I'm uh, not sure which one was referring to, but uh, but yeah, maybe Black that's Widow. the case. He's Probably. Black Widow. And, and Oggy like Bandoggy says, could the Black Widow lawsuit actually help Dune when it comes out? Uh, well, it it in industry. well, I, I'm guessing he mean that uh, if uh, if um, it suddenly sets an industry precedent that you really to, to have go to back to out. theatrical yeah. relief. I hope it sets that because I'm a huge theater fan. You know, uh, I'm going to go to the theater this weekend, and uh, it's it, to me, I'm less interested. Honestly, I don't like. I I for me, it, I work in television, so to me, TV is is something I'm so used to. I like the theatrical experience, right? So I don't like watching stuff on streaming. So yeah, I mean, I I. It, it actually may very well push that because I said the, the deepest layer of all this, it's not even about these two guys fighting for their egos and their power. It's about a, a conflict over the future of the industry. And I hope the theatrical element wins out because it's for everyone's interest for it to win out. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of Dune, I actually think that they have signed all checks that need to be signed behind the scenes there already. So yeah, we'll see what happens with that. Yeah. Uh, and then... Um, the Rock is a James Bond film, says, I think Disney is in worse shape than they were in the early 80s and as bad as in the 40s. How long till they're forced to major course correction? Well, here's the thing, though. It's not, it's not that they're mismanaged. It's not something they can course correct their way out of. It's that their lifeblood is the parks, and the parks yes. have been crippled. There's no course correction for that. And everything else is scrambling to make money somehow with that exactly. stream yeah. hobbled. So it's not that they're mismanaged in any way outside of Star Wars. It's that the external events, force majeure, shut down their parks for a very long time. That's and, really and, it. And that would they, if they were making a lot of money through parks, would they be so aggressive about the streaming window thing? Quite possibly not. Right. I think that's because they also own these theaters and they want the, to advance their theaters. So. That's the thing is I think Disney's hurting right now, and that's where I think that this lawsuit has gotten where it is because I think if they could have paid her off ahead of time, they probably would have. Yeah. Uh, I think they just kind of were hoping it would go away, like you were saying, Cameron, before. Like, they, oh, well, I thought we dealt with this already, and maybe they offered her, like, a piddly amount, and she's like, fuck that. 
I ain't taking that. Screw that. And or, or like, her agent may have sort of handshake right, right, right. something, and she's like, what do you mean? I don't want that, right? Or she may have changed her mind to whatever the handshake agreement was. By the way, I want to address something. There's a, a regular chat by, by Ant Antoinette, uh, which is no Iger put them in debt with the Fox deal. Uh, that is not the pandemic's fault. Uh, you, you're not wrong. You're not, You're not wrong. wrong. Like I said, this is all Mr. Iger's legacy. I don't think he's been a great leader of, of Disney. I don't. I. I think he's played it very. What he thinks is safe, just doing these crappy remakes and live action remakes of classics, and then giving, you know, buying IPs. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, that, I, I think his legacy is bad, and we're seeing the end result of that. Even if they wouldn't have bought, bought Fox, they would still be kind of in the same boat because of the situation we're in right yeah. now. Yeah. But but that didn't help. That didn't help at all. And that's yeah. the thing is, unlike uh, Universal, which has Comcast, WB, which has, you know, um, uh, AT&T and stuff like that to back them up, mm -hmm. you know, basically that's the problem. Disney doesn't have anything to back them up. The parks were their cash flow. Yeah. Parks and merchandising and both of those things have basically come to a dead, dead halt. Well, there's another comment that, that just rolled by, which is about high buying everything on leverage. Uh, puts you in a bad spot. And, you know, I went to business, and, you know, Andre, you're in finance. I went to business school and I remember sitting at, at, at in my MBA class. And I'm, I'm like, not Mr. Finance. I was always a creative guy, even in business school. I'm like, what am I doing here? But I was sitting there and I remember one of our corporate finance teachers, professors, giving us, showing us this model about basically the more debt you take on, the more profitable your long term result is. I'm like, uh, professor, don't you have to repay the debt? Doesn't interest rise in the debt? Won't that eat away at your profits? And everyone's like, you're just not seeing the bigger vision. I'm like, no, I think you're a shill for the the uh, the, the the bond industry, professor. I think that's yeah, exactly it's that's that professor wasn't up on his ratio analysis because that's what that is for. That's like seeing how much gearing can a company take. Like how much at what point does gearing go from being an asset to being a liability? Right. And I, I was like. I was the only one that's like, Professor, that does not make any sense to me, right? But yeah, that, 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 that sounds still like a very, uh, <laughs> very irresponsible professor, of which there are many now, to, now these days. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. academia academia is often, and this is academia across the boards, including in business schools, is often reflecting the people that are supporting their grants and this and that. And so that's the way it is. Yeah. Uh, all right, moving on. Uh, we have uh, Team Worm who says for $10, thank you so much. Disney and Scarja will settle, but it made sense for Disney to wait and see how the film would actually perform versus negotiating earlier when the parties would all be speculating how it might. Right, and that's how they thought about it, but now it's blown up in their face. This was, they should have preemptively cut this, but part of it is the arrogance of Disney, which assumes that everyone is going to fall into line, right? And that's yeah. why the industry is shocked because they didn't think Scarlett Johansson, the number one actress in the world, would, would take on Disney. In fact, she's the only one that could take on Disney. She and The Rock are essentially the people that can take on Disney. And she did it, right? Uh, and so, you know, it is what it is. Hold on one second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step off the screen for a second. And someone's knocking on my door. So I'll be back in just one second. Right, absolutely. I'll do some more suggestions in the meantime. Uh, 200 Watt Studio says, suddenly, just like that, Scarlett is a capitalist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, if she ever was anything else, she faked it yeah and then ben saxon says for five dollars i brought this up last night on after dark a retired ceo immediately goes to the board for however long that that company wishes yeah. and roof korean the based well, i like that name says for ten dollars do a lot do not let disney or others use the coof as an excuse corporation used the coof for their benefit for too long Scar Joe on consumer side all along, anti-sexualization statements made under duress. Uh, yeah, like, don't trust these people, to be honest. And Oki Ben Doki says, Lucasfilm is the catalyst. And then we have Mags chiming in for $10. Oh, thank you so much, Mags. Hey, everyone. Working and lurking today. But wanted to say, uh, 1.9 K are watching. At least at the time, it was 1.9. Now we got 2.1. Now yeah, we have we're doing 2 .1. That pretty good. I mean, I think this is, you uh, know, I, I think this is uh, one, one of the larger streams we've had. Well, no, yeah, yeah. And, uh, if you yeah, haven't hit that like button, people, please, please do. Uh, couple weeks. At least Come on, I hit the like button. Everybody else get on board. Come on. Yeah. Uh, and then it says, uh, yeah, please hit the like button for Kamran Pasha. Tom and Andre, love you all. 
Uh, and uh, STR Red Wolf says, will this very public fight be more entertaining than any of the Lucasfilm releases? Well, but I want. I think there already are. I think you probably had more fun watching this dream than most people did during the last th three Star Wars movies. And if I'm wrong, then let me know in the comments. No, this is. I mean, this is look, this is this is real drama with heroes and villains and 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 wars and and people simply. I mean, this is great. <laughs> the industry is absolutely entertained and fascinated right now. Yeah, and we, <laughs> and it didn't cost three hundred million dollars to make. Although, of course, it might cost much more than that for Disney in the end. But yeah, yeah that's neither here nor there. Um. Yeah, uh, and then we have. Um, a uh, roof Korean the base also wonders is this how Feige escapes the SJW tyrannical agenda forced into Marvel by people who sit behind desks at Disney Trojan horse to steer Marvel back well, that I, all I don't think he's brought into it. Yeah, it, let's I hear know. what you have to say no I I don't it all depends on whether he's bought into it I never got the impression that this was coming as an external influence from from Disney I think Mr Feige has had a lot of independent control uh at least of the creative element of uh thing he may he feel he's losing control of the distribution element that's why this war is beginning right uh in fact he has lost control of distribution under Chapek and so I never got the impression that he had, he wasn't the final say on the creative. So uh, I don't think this is Disney executives saying put woke stuff in there. In fact, I think Disney executives have already figured out from Lucasfilm that it wasn't working at the same time that Mr. Feige said, I kind of like, I'm going to get on this boat. So. Yeah, I, I think so too. I think that in terms of wokeness right now, Kevin Feige is the problem and Bob Chapek just might be the savior. Yeah, it, it, this is going to get real interesting. I still put my bets down that Chapek will outsmart this. I just think he will. Uh, I think he's been caught. He's seen now that he has a weak point. He didn't see that uh, this coming. Perhaps he should have, but I don't think any of us really saw this coming, uh, that there would be a public attack like this. I, I'm sure he thought he settled out his understanding with, with Scarlet's uh, agent. I can't believe that he would have thought that this was an unresolved issue. So now he's going to hopefully resolve this. It's going to be drama on this particular topic for maybe a few days. And if it goes longer than that, then then he's in serious trouble to re remain in, in charge of Disney, which would be Feige's plan. Yeah. And then Sporking News Podcast. He has a great channel. Check it out. It says for $5, keep up the great work. Also, Tom, who is the new Ghostbusters ghost supposed to be? Slimer was Belushi. Any ideas on the new one? Thank you for all the support. And yeah, again, check out Sporking News Podcast. Tom, um, who do you think the new ghost is? Well, there's, they already talked a little bit about the one new ghost. I know I think Slimer's still in there along with a few of the other classics. Mm -hmm. um, but there's one called Chomper that's in the new one. Chomper, okay. That's who's a good name. To, who's supposed to take kind of the place of the mean-spirited. Because uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but Jason Reitman said Slimer over the years has kind of become, you know, more of a mascot and not as scary. Yeah. So they wanted a ghost that was in the same vein but scary again. So they brought in a new one called Chomper. And I think you see him real quick in the trailer. He's the one the kids are going after. Well, well Slimer was never the main ghost. He was always Zool. No, no, no. no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Marshmallow Man or whatever. Yeah, He's those are supposed guy. to be back and all that stuff in this one. If, as Slimer was the Orko of Ghostbusters. Basically, yeah. And 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 that was because of the cartoon that happened. Yeah. Um, but initially, yeah, the Onion Head, a.k.a. Slimer, was meant to be... A, a scarier ghost and then after the death of john belushi john kind of request or dan Aykroyd kind of requested that uh the effects guys try to incorporate some of john's personality and looks into the character and that kind of translated through and that's probably why he became more lovable so i can understand uh oh muncher is that what it is joel rise i'm sorry i knew it's something like that <laughs> fake news i'm fake news yeah it's muncher my bad muncher is the new one Oh my god, and that, that has so many innuendos, but we'll keep yeah, going. I know. Okay, so yeah, there's yeah. a new one called Muncher, and yeah, he, he I think he's in the trailer, if I'm not mistaken. But no worries, Slimer is in like the clue game and some other things. So Slimer is there, as far as I know, he's in the movie. And right. Sean Carter says a quote from Bob Chapek: I'm altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. <laughs> uh Michael well, Miller. I, I uh, hope JPEG is that I yeah, hope JPEG, you know, I hope JPEG ends up being as skillful as Palpatine. Ultimately, I know that's a quote, that's a quote from Vader, but ultimately I hope JPEG is as skillful as Palpatine because he's gonna need to be to survive this. 
Yeah. And well, then Michael Miller, uh, obviously in reference to how Chapek clearly wants to like end long-term co 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 uh, contracts, can't help but think of Kurtzman's five-year contract. I mean, yeah, they need something. Well, like that, that. yeah, that's uh, that's over at CBS, which is which is a different yeah. Viacom and all that. So, uh, but 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 yeah, I mean, that's that's the kind of stuff that the the perks of the club that he's attacking, and that's why there's so much agitation because he's attacking the club. Yeah. And Moldovan Allen says late to the conversation, but is now the moment to attack, considering the next Marvel movies look like duds and would bury Iger and friends. Well, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I'm curious because I know what Cameron's saying and I understand where he's coming from, but there's all this other stuff. And I'm real curious who is really pulling what strings here and Who's really going to come out smelling like, like roses here and who's going to look like the dud? Because I see I, uh, Iger's trying to protect his legacy at this point, mm -hmm. but Chapek's trying to get this company you know, back in order. And you had Iger swoop in like Big Daddy going, oh, well, shit's about to hit the fan, and uh, I need to come back and charge. Which is funny how he came back into the fold just before the lockdown but i'm not going to speculate on that anymore well, i have my own theories as to how um, yeah we're not going to we'll get into on. that we'll we're going to move away from that but point being is you have basically a guy who just gave you the keys to the car and he's like wait a minute i'm going to drive to the store and then it's like what well, well, didn't you just give me the keys it's like yeah 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 but you don't yeah, know how it, to it was bizarre by hollywood standards <laughs> i didn't like it people are like what he's back it was bizarre by hollywood standards so whatever i don't yeah. think i've ever seen anything like that ever before and, and it, it was it was insulting. I could not imagine that Chapek wasn't insulted. At I've that heard moment. you know there's been plenty of times where uh, uh, someone won't last a year or mm -hmm. something like that, but I've never seen a situation where like the old guy comes in while the new guy is still there in, in this whole. I've never ever. He I, was I, there I, like six weeks before this happened. Not it even. Crazy. It was yeah. It yeah. was crazy. So whatever. Yeah, so was, that was, was going to be crazy. But this we have is, some more yeah. super chats to go through. And here. I, then I do need to wind down. So if we can get to anyone, exactly. that, that, that's what I, I need. Address. Yes. Yeah. We yeah. Get uh, the, let's see here. Um, we have um, uh, House of Trades who says, "Hail Kamran." Yesterday, Robert Meyer Burnett did a stream on the subject. He said, "No one is surprised by this lawsuit. That most were waiting for it to come." I have great respect for Robert Meyer Burnett. I've been on a channel with him a few times. Uh, I just don't share a lot of opinions with him. I think, on, especially when it comes to Disney, we've had often very different opinions, especially with regard to Miss Kennedy. And I, I do think that the that the industry is surprised. Uh, maybe in his colleagues were expecting this. Maybe he was expecting this. Uh, I wasn't expecting this because the normal thing to do would have been to settle this out with with her, as was done, you know, by Warner's and Gal Gadot on on uh, on Wonder Woman in advance, right? And so this lawsuit is not normal. This isn't how you handle business in this town. Lawsuits normally mean the end of people's careers, so people don't like doing them, right? So only someone like us, Scarlett Johansson, can do it. And knowing that that is Scarlett Johansson, and knowing she's represented by Brian Lord at CAA, the head of the the, the agency, I just can't imagine that that Chapek didn't think this was already a resolved, even if it was just a handshake, we'll work it out issue. I don't agree with Mr. Burnett on this. If his connections were not surprised, God bless him. People I know were surprised. I was surprised. And uh, the industry's reaction shows surprise. I mean, I'll say this much. I'm not surprised in a sense that she would say something. I'm surprised that it got to this point, like I said before. that yeah, that's that, This is not how you handle it unless right. it's part of something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then moving, since you have to go here, uh, Maladin077 says, thank you, Mr. Pasha, for your insight. Keep up the great work, guys. And Darking, this may be the one you were referring to. Uh, coming on set for five Australian dollars. Can we talk about Frank Miller getting cancelled for alleged Islamophobia from some convention in the UK? I'd like to hear Kamran's opinion on holy terror, which I think is a great Yeah, I mean, my opinion is Mr. Miller is a very talented guy uh, and he's a proud Muslim anti Muslim bigot. So it's not, I mean, I think that's what he is. <laughs> I think, you know, I think he's that's his politics. I don't think he's ever been ashamed of it. Uh, being a Muslim, I don't appreciate it. So, like I said, I mean, I, I'm not about canceling anybody, uh, but am I a fan of that kind of material coming from him? No, I'm not. Uh, you know, and I know I've seen Holy Terror and it's, it's an offensively stupid 
stupid thing. And it, it misrepresents who we Muslims are. And it's coming from a guy with a very ugly agenda on that. And that may be an incredibly unpopular opinion, but don't expect me to back somebody who insults my religion and my community, which is what he's doing. He's free to do it. I'm not interested in canceling anybody, but I'm also not his fan. And I'm going to say he's right on this. That's my answer to that. Yeah. And then Christopher Neal says for $10, Mr. Kamran Pasha is the Grand Master Yoda of Hollywood. Love his analysis. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I those are the. Yeah, and I just want to. I actually want to respond. People are saying. People are saying in the chat, not true. You know, he he apologized for Holy Terror. All I'm commenting is Holy Terror is a stupid book, right? And so whether he apologizes for not, he's he's his politics were well known. I don't think he. You know, I don't think he's he's particularly a fan of Islam. I don't think that that's true. He can apologize as much as he wants. I think his politics and his beliefs are very well known. And uh, and everyone apologizes when they get a big backlash but that's who he is and i appreciate other material that he's done as an artist i think he's very talented but i don't i think that's who he is and uh and i don't have to like it so we'll keep moving yeah no exactly uh exactly uh and Kamran, how much longer do you have i uh, maybe i got probably about five minutes uh because i do need to wind down if there's something yeah I'm absolutely that's like so is there, is there any is there any last thing and i do i want to acknowledge actually someone in in the who's who think uh i think of tara erickson who says i work in egypt an islamic country and some of the most beautiful and ethical people ever i've been to egypt it's one of my favorite places on earth a uh, lovely 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 people uh, and uh, i agree with you so thank you very much and now we'll get back on track here Yes, exactly. I'm just looking for more th that are specifically for uh, for uh, good for you here. Um, uh, Tai Raslan says for five dollars, just like when the Gina story exploded right before a quarterly report. Now all this just before a quarterly report, going to be a tough one, right? Yeah, it's going to be a tough quarterly report, and that's why it was done on purpose. This is a war. This isn't. This isn't. This is a normal strategic behavior to get money. This is part of something much deeper. Uh, and also, the seaman says, "How much will the bridge burn between many actor agencies and Disney after this? Maybe new opportunities for unknown actors at Disney Studios soon." It, the idea being that this this will push these incidents will push lesser known actors because the bigger actors are are in contact. Yeah, or or maybe the agencies that may say that maybe I think what he's implying is that well now Disney's going to be pissed at these agencies. Well, I mean the agencies are the lifeblood of the system. The writers learned that recently when we tried to go against them, right? They are, they are still the blood of the end because they control all the information, right? And so uh, so you can be pissed. People don't like agents. You know, and yet the agents have the power. They don't really care. And so, and my agents are very nice people, but they, I know they have certain powers that I don't because they have been, they have context that I don't. Um, so, you know, I mean, I don't think that there's going to be a broader. I think they're always going to be trying to find new talent because people age out. You know, you know, there's Scarlett Johansson. You know, is still, in my view, a very lovely woman. And uh, and uh, but you know, people are already grumbling. Oh, well, she's getting older, whatever. And the industry has no mercy for women after they're thirty, and she's past that. So it, actors age out anyway. And you'll often notice actors when they feel like they're they've reached the peak of what they're going to be able to do in this town, they will then try to cash out, and that's part of what might be happening here. Um, and there, but there'll always be a new crop, and I don't think this this situation is going to accelerate that or impact that. There's always going to be a new crop of people they want to push. And then one final one from Brian Sloan that says, Kamran, I enjoy historical fiction and alternate history fiction. Where can I buy your books on the Crusades? Well, let me show them to you. Hold on. So my two novels, my one that uh, Mexican Iron Man is reading and a few others and really liking it. This is Shadow of the Swords, my novel on the Crusades based on my original screenplay. Uh, and my novel on the birth of Islam, uh, Mother of the Believers, Told from the Virginity of the Prophet's Wife. They're both available, barnesandnoble.com, amazon.com. So if you want to buy them there, you can also go to my website, cameronpasha.com, which will have direct Which is link to in the description. Also, yeah. yeah. And, and I see, I mean, look, I see there are the chats gone. this grumbly religion argument going on here. I'm not going to engage this any further. Yeah, I don't if think you raise it, if, you raise this, if you raise this, I'm going to respond. And then you get, this has happened a few other times, Andre, we witnessed this. Somebody raises this and then everyone decides to go off on a, on a, 
Islam yeah. sucks, religion all sucks. I, all I will say on that is that religion is a great tool for dividing people apart, but that's not what we're here for. We're not here for We and, are and, here for everything that we, and, and I, I, I love this fan base. But if you're going to ask me about my faith, I'll respond to it. And then the chat should just move on from it because you're not going to resolve several thousand years of arguments in this chat about religion. So let's keep moving. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty certain. Yeah. So let's focus on what we're on here, what we agree on, and what unites yeah. us together. Absolutely. So with that, uh, I would like to, to say thank you to Kamran for joining us today and for your most excellent insights in what was... A, a very eventful show, and uh, and the day is still young. So this is this is going to be fun. To come. So let's let's make an intention that uh, I'd love to come back on sometime next week. Uh, I think the situation is going to have a lot more surprise twists this weekend and next week to talk about. Other things are going to happen that we're not seeing yet. Uh, and so I'd love to be able to come back and talk about this next week, depending on everyone's schedule, because I think this is going to be breaking news for a bit. I think so too. I mean, this is. Um... Uh, Kevin Smith is probably really happy about this because he took the attention away from him. So, yeah. Scott Wood is like, ah, look at them. These guys fight. I'm done. <laughs> I'm going to yeah, throw, exactly. throw my phone at somebody. No one's going to notice. <laughs> Kamran, it's been crazy. a pleasure to have you on as always. And I look forward to seeing how all this is going to continue to develop over the course of the weekend and especially next week. So, yeah, it's going to be awesome. It's always not beyond. I think this is the best channel in the fandom, personally, and uh, I'm delighted that that I have become a regular here. Uh, and uh, and so I'm looking forward to your analyses because you break a lot of information that makes me think. And today we had a remarkable show where things were broken and prophecies came true within one minute. Of the <laughs> yeah. So I see a reputation continues. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, Kamran, take All right, care. Bless everyone and... to the chat. All right. Take yeah. Care. And uh, we are going to continue with these super chats. I just have to yes. see where we where we were. Uh, let's see. Um, STR Red Wolf says, "Will this very public fight be more entertaining than any of the Lucasfilm releases?" Oh yeah, absolutely, it will be. Uh, uh, let's see. We got that. Oh yeah, here we are. Uh, then we got to. Uh, Douglas Marsh, who says for five pounds, Marvel's Disney Plus shows have been perform have been performed disappointingly, to say it the least. And Chapek is holding Feige to account. Yeah, there may be some of that. Uh, and uh, Ruth the Hens, Ruthie Hansel fan, Ruthie Hansel fan, ninety nine. Says for five dollars, if I were Scarjo and Miss Stone, I'd pull an Olivia de Havilland and take this to the S Supreme Court if they can. Well, it has to go through a number of instances first, but chances are this is going to be settled out of court. But yeah, we'll see what happens with that. And Christopher Neal said that Pam the Commandant Pasha is the Grandmaster Yoda of Hollywood. And Stephen Otten says, I would suggest paying actors based on how well the movie performs. Sadly, excellent movies like The Outpost fall through the cracks. They do indeed. Until All Are One says, this has been an amazing and revealing discussion. So glad I tuned in. Hail Kamran and Midnight's Edge guys. And uh, as things were breaking, uh, breaking with uh, with um, Emma Stone and everything, Mags said, "Fight, fight, fight! I'll grab the popcorn." <laughs> Indeed. And Mexican Iron Man chimed in with another chimed in with another ten dollar, saying, "Today is the best Midnight's Edge ever." So two things: one, I guess Bob Iger won't be running for president anytime soon. LOL. And two. Looks like HBO's real life I am Ari is pulling out the paintball gun. <laughs> That's an uh, entourage. Uh, yeah. And Troy Paselli says this was bound to happen eventually. I predicted this almost a year ago. This needs to happen to kick the studios in the collective asses. Lord Trinan says all this talk of open warfare. I'm picturing an army of black widows attacking the Disney castle, defended by soldiers all wearing Mickey Mouse ears. That's quite a visual right there. 
And Grand was 242 says that is open warfare until the end. The losing party will stay on the battlefield covered in blood. Uh, and uh, uh, Mexican Iron Man said that scene in Swords is freaking awesome. Yeah, we got that one. And Vorpal Bunny's Revenge said someday a movie will be made about this, but disguised in a metaphor for something else. Probably. And House Atreides says Andre, Tom, and Kamran. How does Netflix do contracts with talent? Does Disney have to start doing similar style of contracts? Yes, they absolutely, and they're doing that now. But here's the thing. The problem is the movies, the blockbuster movies, where the contract promised box office points because they were, were the contracts were made at the time before the pandemic, and or rather, I should say, before the lockdowns. Uh, and so suddenly the reality has changed while the contracts haven't. So this well, is going to be an issue for all the contracts that were written the last three years up until the last few months. When they make these contracts, I guarantee you when it comes to like a sale, like I'm sure it says somewhere in the contract, like if there's a sale prior to any theatrical release, then the actor will get X amount, right? Or whoever. In this case, though, there was no sale. but Disney just basically split their box office in half or whatever you want to put it by throwing it on Disney plus and then created a chain of events that really are, this is the thing that, and not to go on some diatribe real quick, but like, this is kind of the undoing of Hollywood in and of, of itself. And this is why I kept saying, you know, a year ago when everybody's like, Oh, streaming is going to be the death of theaters. It's going to be the death of theaters. I'm like, I don't think so. It's more like it's going to be the death of the studio system. If they ain't fucking careful because exactly what I predicted was going to happen is kind of happening now is the money ain't there. And you have all these actors and directors and other studio and, and uh, not studios, but uh, production houses that are going, where's my fucking money? You know, it's kind of like the South Park episode where everybody wants their youth, their, their, their uh, internet money. Do you remember, ever see that one, Andre? Uh, yeah. Where all it's the great. memes show up and they're like, we want our internet internet money. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's what you basically have here is all these people who are lining up going, where's my internet money? And they're going, well, well, there is no internet money. This is all loss leader shit. So that's where this lawsuit, I think, comes from. And it's going to continue and it's going to, this is going to pile on. Because what they're seeing here is you have a, a, a big problem that the studios just created for themselves because of this idea that they, oh, we're going to kill the theaters. And at the same time, we're going to kickstart this direct to consumer thing. Because this is what they've wanted to do all this time. And it's almost like they're doing the reverse of what the music industry did to kill themselves. Instead of embracing digital at the time that the music industry did, they rejected the fuck out of it. And then now, you know, they're barely hanging on. The The film industry, in, instead of rejecting the, the, the digital when they should have, they embraced it. Now it's fucking going to become their undoing. So it's really kind of strange how this is. I can see a lot of parallels with the, the music industry, but there's they're kind of like a reversal. I don't know if you get what I'm saying, Andre, but it's it's kind of nuts how they thought that this was going to be the way things were going to work this soon. This is 10, 15 years out, and I've been saying this for a while. There's no way this is going to work yet. People are not ready to just sign up and sign over everything to these studios. It's just they're not. Yeah. And so moving on from there. Um uh, Rob Adamson says, ScarJo's actions seem strange. If she wanted to maximize ticket sales, why would she participate in a marketing campaign that attacked the fan base? Well, that's easy. Her contract said that she is supposed to be part of the marketing. And if the people ahead of the marketing decides that, you know what, it's a good idea to attack the fan base, then attacking the fans is exactly what she's going to do as part of her contract. There's no bigger mystery to it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Grand Wasu 42 says for five euros, this reminds me of um, uh, Lorenzo the Medici and the Pazzi incident. When Feige is not able to finish shaping off, then La Familia will take care of him. Uh, yeah, we'll see who wins out here because uh, now suddenly it became uh, it uh, it became. Uh, Feige and Iger and all the Disney talent versus JPEX. Let's see how that plays out. Uh, and uh, then 
Uh, let's see, we got this one. Uh, the Last Millennial says, Hey guys, can someone explain to me what exactly Feige is guilty of and why it's a JPEG versus Feige situation? I just joined. Yeah, well, real quickly, uh, JPEG, he wants to institute changes uh, so that uh, the, the management, the people like Feige, they're not there for like five, ten year contracts as it is now. Instead, they'll be there for like one and two year contracts so that if they don't perform, they can be gotten rid of quickly. And everyone in Disney is against this. And one of the reasons why Chapik wanted is because he doesn't want a repeat of Kathleen Kennedy, but at the same time, he also may want to get rid of Feige. And uh, Feige is um, he's starting to become a little bit Kathleen Kennedy-ish because he may be the one pushing the wokeness in Disney features. So basically, that's what it's about. Uh, and uh, then Mecca J, following on with the uh, with the um, uh, you know Amber Turd stuff, says there is also claims that MGM is purposely trying to prevent Johnny Depp's latest movie. Minamata from getting a release in the US. Well, that would suck if that's the case, but uh, yeah. And then Mags says, grab the popcorn, folks, because yeah, this was when the Emma Stone uh, news uh, dropped. Golgo13 says, Kamran, I am optimistically cautious about Batgirl. Well, we'll see, we'll see how that works out. And the Jack of All Casuals sent us a $10 doggy, doggy super sticker, so thanks so much for that. Oggy Ben Doggy uh, says or asks Christopher Nolan, although I don't know quite exactly what the full extent of the question is. Um, but um, um, well, it yeah. could have been referring to the whole fact that he might turn around and sue. Maybe, well, not um, Disney, but he would sue HBO and Warner. But they probably paid his ass off. See, that's yeah, the thing. Probably. Warner Warner was smart on this. I mean, right. Well, reasonably, I mean, they, they paid they, off. Uh, they paid they off the paid one everybody one off. People. It, but no, but really, Not look everybody. At it. Well, everybody so far that was going to make a everyone stink. that mattered, everyone that yeah. was like, this is going to be like bad PR, so we're going to pay. They off already our lost Wonder Nolan, Woman. though. So unless, yeah. yeah, I mean, but that that could mean maybe they didn't pay him any actually. But it all depends on what his con. I mean, this is because of ScarJo's contract and. Trust me, she would not have done this, or her lawyers wouldn't have let her do this, and her agents, if they didn't think she had some kind of ground to stand on. And I'm sure Nolan's got a league of lawyers that were looking into the same kind of madness when this was going on with HBO because they pissed a lot of people off. But then all they did was just turn around and pay everybody off. And that's why I say it was a loss leader. And out of all this, they're the only ones that came out kind of smelling like roses because HBO Max is the only one that's on the on the upward swing the rest of them are losing numbers like crazy uh netflix and disney plus have like been boasting millions by the month they're losing yeah i don't know how much a boast that is but uh well, not but, boasting yeah. yeah you're right yeah. sorry poor choice <laughs> yeah. poor cho yeah. i should say the media is boasting yeah that or the, no the media is gloating gloating thank you yeah, i don't know. more like it Fucking a. Like this, you know, I need some protein used to be here. Posting about like their, <laughs> well, we're almost done here. Uh, and then Sharon C says a strong possibility of claims are similar. Class action. Uh, and uh, mm. the Jack of All Casual says, Morning, Andre, Tom, Cameron, Wrenches, and Chat. Loving this stream on my way to work. Better than radio. Oh, we aim to please. Well, as far as a class action. Day for Disney? Well, how uh, could it be? Well, uh, not I, I yet, but uh, getting there. I don't see the actors or directors going in with a class action because then that's like a totally different thing. But you could see like possibly through the guilds if there's other crew and uh, other portions of the filmmaking process, the people in that that are supposed to get money on the back end. Now that they see this, if there's similar situations, you may see some class action lawsuits go into effect. Uh, if you know what I mean, Andre, that could very possibly be. But I, most of the time, most stages beyond director, actor, and plausibly a writer generally are work for hire. So they're not going to have anything to really do. Yeah, probably. Uh, and uh, moving on from there, um, a Culture Casino says, let's consider what HBO is in for. Dune, 
Suicide Squad. Uh, and I'm looking forward to both, to be honest. I can't believe uh, the reviews that Suicide Squad is getting. Well, it looks fun. Like, I didn't like the first trailer, but everything I've seen since kind of makes it look I don't know if it's still fun. 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, and I know that doesn't mean well, much. Well, but... that doesn't really mean much. Uh, I'm more interested in, like, the audience response, but I think it's going to be fun. So we'll, we'll see. Right, right, exactly. I've been wrong on stuff like that before. Because sometimes, we'll sometimes 100% on the Rotten Tomatoes can be it's a, a bad sign. fucking red flag. Exactly. Yeah, massive red flag. But, but we'll I have see. heard from a few people that uh, I would not say they're not industry type people, but people we know that have seen it and they love the shit out of it. So yeah. I'm looking forward to it. My, my, I'm back kind of like to like, Oh, this might be pretty good. So. And then Bertrand Kurt Russell uh, says in a reference to what we said about Emily Blunt, the recent uh, uh, Mary Poppins, Poppins will sue. Super califragilistic expialidocious. <laughs> Hashtag me sue <laughs> yeah. califragilistic. Uh, and uh, Ram Bam three thousand says, uh, "Yeah, I swear the most accurate portrayal of XX was uh, old Orange Wednesday's adverts. We got that one." Uh, and uh, Big Daddy MRI says for nine dollars ninety nine. I believe these companies in Hollywood will untangle eventually. They are being ordered to make profit. Over time, they will make good entertainment to reverse the current trend and make profit. STR Red Wolf says, okay, I need to get more popcorn. Hold the stream. Oh, is that <laughs> what happened? Is that what happened with uh, when we when we had like this, this there was uh, this major hiccup thing earlier? Yeah. yeah. I don't know what 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 it was, if it was StreamYards or YouTube, but the chats, I got a couple people messaging me saying the chat went out, and yeah, so I don't know what happened. Yeah, they're and trying Bama, to shut us down. And yeah, well, who knows? And uh, Bama Grad says for five dollars, I have serious doubt that Warner would ever have hit those eight hundred thousand plus benchmarks to trigger those multi million. Or sorry, uh, I have serious doubts that Black Widow would ever have hit those eight hundred thousand plus benchmarks to trigger those multi million dollar. Payouts. Any well, comments? that's the thing. Uh, they'll never be able to prove one way or the other. Now, that's because, exactly the issue, and that's the argument that uh, that's going to be in ScarJo's favor. Uh, because you'll never be. This is one of those times where piracy and certain other factors will come into effect. Because I mean, yeah, there's truly an argument to be made that piracy really doesn't hurt the big, you know, the big industry corporations. If anything, it helps a lot of them. But in this case, in these instances, with these movies dropping the way they have, they have seriously been killed by this because we knew and we predicted for that very reason that the second weekend was going to be a huge drop off because everybody who was going to go see it the first weekend went and saw it. Everybody who was ever going to buy it already bought it on Disney Plus, and that means any multiple viewings you would have gotten from your normal Marvel fan base that would have went and seen these movies two, three times already owns it at home and can watch it that two, three times. So right there, that $30 that you think you just made, you just lost how much more in ancillary sales. Plus they're not going to buy that blue right now. So like we said, between that and the, and it being pirated, that does affect this film's outcome. No matter what we think of the film personally, there will never know what potential this film could have had one way or the other. And that's the argument that, you know, that's going to be in ScarJo's favor is that, you know, Disney kind of screwed themselves and, and they're, this is why I don't think it's even going to get to court because they're going to look like fools and they're going to have so much problems with Discovery. So I, I don't see that ever getting that far. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then we have um, uh, Mr. Tickle Trunk says, Cameron's a good dude. And House Atreides says, Andre, can you try to have Robert Meyer Burnett and Kamran on together next week as they have different viewpoints on this lawsuit subject would be a great stream. Or you, you can, can try, try. But, the, but the problem is that this is a, this is not a great time for Mr. Burnett to stream. So the well, schedule you guys might be, be an issue. Say, even without that, you guys would be surprised how difficult it is sometimes. <laughs> To schedule multiple people at the same place. At yeah, the same like time. The, the, there's a reason why we typically have like one and one guest on the on the morning show because scheduling more, uh, especially people who are working professionals in the industry, is they're not so easy to schedule. Uh, and the time that they have, those that also have a YouTube career, uh, they have for the, for 
they've already filled up with that. And then we are actually caught up to where we can get Super Chat on screen again. So, Tom, can you do this one? Rod Thunderheart says, Hail Andre, hail Tom. Love the stream. Looking forward to seeing a positive outcome for ScarJo. Best of luck to her, or for her, sorry. I wonder if Rock and Emily will join. Well, I don't know if you caught this already, uh, Rod, but uh, 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 what's her face for uh, Cruella? Emma, Emma Stone. Emma Stone. Is already considering uh, suing, and her same the same people that represent her and represent Emily. So they're already kind of considering it as well. It said, it said in a recent article, so get prepared, get some popcorn ready kids. Yeah. Cause, uh, uh, and then grand was 42 yeah. says the fans are between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> if JPEG wins, Disney will continue the bad behavior. Are you sure about that? Cause I don't know. So if Feige wins, the Vocosos will have the upper hand. Yeah, and w which of those two do you think sounds like the uh, the the worst scenario? See, and that's the thing is, I don't know how worried Feige is about the Wokoso part up to the point of just. Well, he doesn't have to be if he's one of them. Well, that's what. I, well, that's my point. Is is it is he really, or is he just appeasing those around him? Because you got to remember where he's at. Like he's in the bubble now. And he's been yeah. in the bubble for some time. And that's where same thing with Kevin Smith and some of these other people. We have another one from Rod Thunderheart, who says, Hail Andre and Tom. I am very nearly recovered from my hernia operation. Glad to hear it. That was Hopefully fast. You're taking well, it easy. Yeah. yeah. Still taking it slow, as you said here, however. And I'm glad to hear that. Thank you for everyone for your concern. Well, we're glad to have you uh, feeling mostly better. That that's the that and and to a speedier recovery than you've already had, uh, hopefully, will be from here on out. I don't know how else to put it than that, but yeah, hopefully you get better. I I, I don't know how to say that shit ever. Be well. Be well. Yeah, uh, get better, buddy. It just sounds yeah. silly. I don't know. <laughs> the 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 notion is there, but I don't know. Yeah. With that though, we are fully caught up. It's double been a double check show today. So uh, yeah, I, yeah, I have double checked okay. already. So if anyone thinks that we missed a super chat, now is the time to Speak to up. let us know. Yeah, but I think we got them all. Awesome sauce. Well, there was some other smaller stories, but a lot of that stuff can just wait. Yeah, that um, can wait. Or you can just check us out on Midnight's Af Edge After Dark, which is the sister channel to this. Uh, channel and we uh, covered a lot of stuff last night including the story we talked about today uh well some of them anyway the emma stone is new news but yeah we'll definitely keep you guys posted on all this uh yeah i can't express myself well especially when i'm like half asleep and need food uh but what are you gonna do it's time for koalas in the rain and thank you so much everybody for being here hopefully you hit that like button thank you to the wrenches for all you did we appreciate it uh, is there anything else, Andre, we should... Uh, oh, uh, did you hear the big announcement? We should probably bring that out in a, on the main channel here. Uh, the end of August uh, and the beginning of September, we have two very big uh, interviews coming up. Yes, I heard, but yeah, share the story. Uh, one, Edward James Almost is returning. So we're going to be talking to him in the beginning of September, but mostly uh, revolving around his sci-fi work and franchise uh, genre work. So do join us for that. It'll be a one-on-one -on -one interview with him. Well, one on however many of us, you know, and you guys, uh, but it'll just be, just be him. It's not a reunion one. It's just for uh, Mr. Almost. And then this is another one that we we're very, very excited about. And Polly, I don't know how he pulled it off, but he managed to, in the end of August, we have the one, the only Machete will be here. Folks, Danny Trejo himself is coming to Midnight's Edge. You heard it here, folks. Danny Trejo will be on Midnight's Edge. We don't have an exact date or time yet, but when we do, we'll let you guys know. All we know now is that it, it we're working on the time and day for the end of August. So stay tuned for that, kids. We're very excited about that. Plus, we have other reunions and other things coming. So we've got a ton of great shit on your way, on the way. So stay tuned, guys. And uh, Andre, that was your part. yes. And with that, <laughs> we with all that exciting stuff, it's time for koalas in the rain. Indeed, koalas in the rain, koalas in the rain, no fox given. Koala